right, good evening, everyone. No, no, I, I had this over here. So, um, good evening. So, calling our meeting to order. So, welcome to our PVUSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. So, if you need that support, uh, please see Orania Lopez. So, tenemos traducción, uh, traducción en español. Si necesita de ese servicio, por favor, uh, pase con... Oh, Magdalena. Sorry. Hi, Magdalena. Magdalena Maciel. Um, if you would like to speak to uh, an item on the agenda, then please complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. And then we will go on to our Pledge of Allegiance. And I will ask our student trustee, um, Ruby Romero Maya, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Aww. Thank you. All right, and we will go on to our interim superintendent comments. Thank you, President Holm. I'm not going to comment about what all of you are wondering about or what took place this week. Um, we do have some good words from our president that I hope will be um, captivating. What I want to comment on is something that's inspiring but also very sad, and that is Jason Murphy. Um, I don't know how many of you knew Jason, but Jason was a stellar teacher at Lakeview Middle School. He'd been in our district at least 25 years. And he passed away about six weeks ago. Um, and he knew my son, and I might get a little emotional. He actually inspired my 31-year-old uh, kid when he was back in middle school. And uh, Jason brought that school together. He was a math science teacher. But he, he did so much with sports and fun stuff with the kids at Lakeview that he really was a school-wide asset to the culture. And uh, I hope he's watching us now. So if we could just take 30 seconds of silence to honor Jason Murphy, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Go Eagles. Thank you. We'll go on to our governing board comments. And this is our opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And um, I'd like to offer our student trustee an opportunity if you have any comments this evening. Um, I'll wait till the next meeting. No problem. You. Uh, trustee DeSerpa, did you have any comments? Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. It's really nice to see you. Um, many people in our community have been made aware that there is um, some hate groups coming into town on Sunday to deliver messages of racism and intolerance. And so as a board member, I just want to say that um, those things will not be tolerated here in our district where we um, appreciate inclusivity and tolerance for all people and not just tolerance, but celebration. So I'm sorry to have to tell everybody. A lot of people have been getting the emails, but um, we're not gonna stand for that here in Pajaro Valley. Thank you. Trustee Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'll yield my comments tonight in order to progress the meeting. Thank you. Trustee Scow. Good evening, everybody. Thanks to everybody who's watching on, online, and uh, thank you for those comments. Trustee DeSerpa, I agree with you on those, on those sentiments. A uh, lot, big agenda item tonight, so I'll keep it moving tonight. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Flores. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to be here tonight. I also will yield my comments. Vice President Acosta. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you and welcome this evening, and I am also gonna yield my comments this evening. I wanted to address um, my gratitude to Mr. Sheckman and the members of the community who alerted me to, and other members of this board, to a video that showed somebody delivering a racist rant to one of our students. 
um, the behavior displayed was appalling. And the district took immediate steps to ensure that these kind of actions are not represented in our classrooms or by our employees. And while this individual is no longer an employee of the district, I would encourage any staff, students, or family members who feel they need additional support in processing this incident to reach out to our wellness team. Um, and please reach out. It's, I think I'll, I'll leave it with that. But um, know that the board cares about you. That you know. I know I've had many conversations with Mr. Sheckman over the last few days. You know to ensure that people have gotten support. And I know that um, we're committed that people be treated fairly and appropriately. So that's those are my comments for the evening. Welcome. And we have, so we'll go on to 3.5, our high school students board representatives reports. We have, um, do we have a video or students from Aptos High? Hi, my name is Ryan Ortiz and I'm the new activities director at Aptos High School. I'm very excited to introduce to you our Making Waves weekly announcements, which is a weekly video podcast created by students and some select staff that discusses events going on around campus, all the news that students need to know to be successful, fun activities, and ways to get involved with our school. So please subscribe at AHS Making Waves on YouTube. Hi, I'm Lily Martinez, your ASD president. Hi, I'm E. Evans, your ASC Vice President. Hi, I'm Julia Nevick, your ASC Secretary. And I'm Sexy Garcia, your ASC Treasurer. Welcome back, and this is your Making Waves Weekly Announcement. Hi, I'm Gamble Kellemeyer. And I'm Austin Barr. And this, this is your Making Waves, Waves Weekly Announcements. We've had an exciting start of the school year with a fun rally, dance, helm kickoff party. The helm! And now we're gearing up for homecoming. Homecoming week will be the last week of September. There will be spirit days, class skits, parade on campus, and a rally that Friday. We'll also host a football game and we'll have a dance Saturday, September 30th. Meanwhile. Hey, let's go to class. All right, bet. Whoa, 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 you can't pick up your Chromebook like that. You gotta pick it up by its base. Oh, okay, good to know. Chromebook should be picked up by its base, not by the screen. If you do that, it'll most likely damage it. And now it's time to meet some of our other Mariner leaders. Hello, Mariners. I am Dr. Allison Hink Sloan. It's easier to just call me Dr. AHS, same as at Cross High. We are so glad you are here. It is the start of the 23-24 school year, and our goal this year is to sail with joy, with trust, and belief. Let's look out for each other and make this an awesome year. We had such a good time for our first ever home kickoff party last Friday for our home opener football game. Students were hyped, spirited, and enjoyed a good time all together. If you missed it, here are some photos and videos from our first ever home kickoff party. next week on Wednesday, September 13th. This is a great opportunity for clubs to advertise themselves and recruit new members. Everyone is invited to come out and check out which clubs Atos High is offering this year. Find us by the flagpole at lunch next Wednesday. And freshmen chose Princess and the Frog. He is trying to hold it together. <laughs> okay. My eyes are watering. Give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> I'm not good at not laughing. That's it, Mariners. Have a great day. And remember to subscribe. Perfect. Okay, give me the I'm like laughing that whole time.
have, um, thank you. Thank you, Mariners. And we have students from uh, Renaissance High. Hello, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Anthony. Uh, I'm the student leadership leader of Renaissance High School. Which one? This one? Okay. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, the student of the month for September, uh, Jesse Espindola and Samantha Moreno. Uh, congrats on your recognition. Uh, what's going on at Renaissance is uh, map testing in English and developing occupational work exper experience program with a classroom support component. Uh, the changes for the 2022-2024 uh, year is a superintendent's duty advisory committee. Um, last time they had a really good dialogue, really good connection with the superintendent and the students hope to keep that, to keep the same. Uh, we've changed uh, from variable credit to pass or no pass. <laughs> Some students aren't a really big fan of that because they think that it's still the same system from their original schools. So not a lot of students aren't really happy with that. And the role of academic advisors has changed. They, they have been stripped away from helping students, uh, from choosing their classes and the classes that they need. And I think that's kind of a very big uh, situation. Um, after school programming uh, forthcoming I think that's a very big thing that we need at Renaissance but what we're what we kind of need and it's kind of hard to like kind of get is transportation and we also have to change up our schedule we have to we have to enter earlier and also get out earlier which is kind of like a little different than what we're used to and quarterly student intake. Um, so far, they're taking students by, I think, semester. And I don't think that's really helpful for students that, are, that need to go to Renaissance, that need to catch up. Uh, I have a friend that is supposed to be going to Renaissance later. And it's really holding him back from getting credits that he needs because he's entering till October, which is not a good situation for him. And then uh, our garden update. Uh, our new science teacher is improving our garden, which is a kind of kind of good situation. Um, we have partnered up with Aptos Sand and Gravel and Nursery um, to get more uh, gravel for the garden. Um, we we're planting carrots and beets, which is kind of fun. I'm in that class, so it's really fun to plant to get a plant and know more about the soil and more about agriculture in general. And yeah, we're also cleaning beds that we have to be able to plant more things, to have more stuff in the garden. And uh, pizza and paint is a kind of like event that we had last year. Uh, a lot of students enjoyed it last year. And I want to go, I, wanna, I went around asking this year to students that would, if they would be interested in it, and a lot of them said yes. So I think it would be a good idea to have it this year. Uh, sports, uh, so far we have volleyball going on this year. Um, and we won two out of, two out of three games versus uh, New School High School. The first score for the first one was eight to 15. That's the one we lost. And then we won 11 to 15, no, 15 to 11, sorry. And then we won seven to five. And then the next game is Diamond Tech versus uh, and New School on September six. Uh, facilities, um, a lot of our maintenance and operation have been doing a really good job for us lately. 
uh, they have been removing uh, junk furniture for us. And they've also placed a mini library outside of our front office, which is really nice. And then uh, in the pictures shown right here, uh, the bottom one is our basketball hoop. They recently changed the, the rim and the net for us. Again, maintenance and operation. And on the top picture is a picture of our field. Um, a lot of students have had a lot of problems with the field. There's a lot of uh, potholes and stuff. And as you can see, his foot is in the, the ground. And students are allowed to go onto the field, but they don't because they have, they have a concern that they'll probably get injured in doing so. So no one's really on the field right now. And then he's a little bit more on, on our library outside, or mini library outside. Uh, that was, that was, I think that was at the end of last year. And this is now our little library. And then this is a picture of our senior field trip last year. Um, and they went to Great America. And again, I went, I went around asking people this time and they said that they would love a senior field trip. So I think that's something that we should be looking into. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have, if that was the end? Yes. Uh, we have one public speaker, Chris Webb. Oh, OK. Uh, yes, good evening. I, the only reason I'm saying anything is because some of these changes, the, the way they come, came uh, troubles me a little bit. Um, there, the student leadership body did a survey last year uh, of the student body and the teachers, and that survey was, was eventually stopped by the, by the principal, and one of the things they were asking was about the question of credit versus no credit and uh, variable credits. And 97% of students were in favor of variable credits. 67% of staff were. This is out of 10 of 13 homerooms who were surveyed. Um, also, the fact that these changes came, like, basically with, in spite of any kind of, like, consideration of stakeholders kind of troubles me. And I feel like it's not really serving the student's interest. Um, also, I can't help but recall um, student trustee Moriel, she specifically Another question was who should handle the schedule changes, the academic advisor or the academic counselor? And at this kind of school, what, one of the things that WASC has recognized is that connection with the academic advisor, that daily check-in, and the fact that you have that more personalized attention when it's one to 18 or one to 20 versus one to everyone in the whole school. And that, that position's part-time anyway, so you're not even gonna see them each day. So I've, I've I, I was a little troubled by that, um, and I wanted to make sure that the students had their voices heard, so I did want to share a couple quotes from that survey. Um, you know, I one was, my advisor knows me better than, than anyone. They should do my schedule. Um, another one was from a teacher. We had advisory is essential to student well-being and the size, and, and the, connection, uh, the sense of community and, con and belonging. Um, I feel like as we get away from traditional renaissance, like if we're gonna really do that and just become another comprehensive light kind of school, then I would say just change the name. Change the name and we'll be something else. But it, really, we should get back to what we truly are, especially if we're concerned about like test scores and stuff. If education matters, we need to go back to best practices. Thank you. All right, going on to item, uh, any other public comments? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, item 4.1, our approval of agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Make a motion to approve. All right, can I have a second? I'll second. Okay. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And going on to item 5.1, approval of the August 23rd, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I have a first second. and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. Okay. Motion carries 601.
All right, going on to item 6.1, resolution 232407, instructional <coughs> material sufficiency. Report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. Good evening, President, Home Board Trustees, and Interim Superintendent. Mr. Sheckman, I'm here this evening to present the resolution on instructional material sufficiency. Um, all districts must hold a public hearing by the eighth week of school to make a determination through a resolution that every pupil has sufficient textbooks or instructional materials. Um, the Williams Settle Settlement legislation establishes the sufficiency standard for instructional materials. Instructional materials are defined as materials that are used in class or take home. Um, and that they're designed for use for pupils and their teachers as learning resources and help pupils acquire facts, skills, or opinions or develop cognitive processes. Instructional materials may be printed or non-printed. And, um, and so this evening I'm here to present the resolution that acknowledges that based on school visits and principal assurances that all students have sufficient textbooks and or instructional materials for the 23-24 school year. I can say that all students, uh, K-12, have their um, board adopted curriculum instructional materials. We have on order and are still waiting for a few science kits, but they are not the actual curriculum, as well as um, for elementary and for middle school, and they're on um, order. The world language, we have it online 100%. Students have full access to the curriculum. It's a brand new adoption that you approved earlier this year. Um, and we are still waiting for a couple of hard copy for use in the classroom. And so those are all on order and should be here. So this evening it is a public hearing and I will be back at the next board meeting to have the resolution um, passed. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Chris Webb. Uh, yes, so at, uh, at Renaissance, one of the things that we don't have is a Spanish teacher. And I know people would probably say, well, there's ingenuity. But that's, that's maybe not the best um, solution for everyone. And I, I think it's kind of just morally not right to have a, a graduation requirement that cannot be filled with the human. Um, also, um, last year, starting last year, we started to get uh, newcomer English language learners. So, so we, we've historically served as English language learners for a long time, but we have never normally gotten people who don't speak like any English. And I think if we are to be um, receiving students like that, then we should get, like I'd like to have my textbooks, I, at least one textbook for, for each of my different sections to be fully Spanish so that I could support them in that way. I Really, I, I feel like they should, they should be at schools where there is all the um, resources that would normally be provided for someone so that we could fulfill their educational rights. Um, such as like a comprehensive, such as like an ELD program, a new cover program. Um, I think like without those things, it's, it's a bit of a misreferral. But uh, at least if we are going to stick with it, I would like to have those other textbooks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public speakers? All right. Any discussion from the board? And you said this will be coming back as an action item uh, for the next meeting? Yes. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right. Um, going on to our uh, visitor non-agenda items, our 7.1 public comments. So this is our opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Um, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have two, Chris Webb and Marilyn. I'd like to express my appreciation for the super, the interim superintendent and the board members who have um, publicly spoken in support of having a collaborative environment. Um, I, I feel like that's, that's a good move and I'm hoping that kind of sticks. I just wish it would, that sense was transmitted to the people in between you and me. Um, there's there's people in between us. I feel like my my principal is collaborative, and 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 I don't put any of these um, changes that I think are maybe not the best. I don't put those on him. These are things that he inherited. But I do worry that if we don't become more collaborative, I do worry about longev longevity for for admin who inherit things that maybe don't make the most sense. Um, also, I about the there is a a concern on on racism that I have, and that is. Um, 
like we, we brought up the, the variable credit thing, I, which I am committed to because it, it rewards meritocracy. But um, in the absence of that, there's been some, some credit inflation. And I don't feel like this serves the students. And I feel like if we were at another school, I wonder if they would do that. Um, it, it makes me feel like you know, the Renaissance population is maybe being taken advantage of. So um, I, have, I, I consider that a form of racism. If you deny people the class with the teacher, if you deny them a field, if you deny them, um, if you inflate the credits, one of the things I heard this year from a student who matriculated, so a success, is that he um, was he was applying for a job, and and the the employer said that Renaissance students were the last to get hired, and I, that that troubled me because that made me worry that like if we don't really commit to the education piece, if we're more about the numbers and the dashboard and not an authentic approach, that we are doing a disservice. So. Um, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett, retired teacher from the school district. What I pulled off my shelf is a, a book, Vaccination, the Silent Killer. A clear and present danger. Lots of documentation by Ida Onoroff and E. McBean. 1977. Nothing safe and effective about these shots. I have a document here called Myths and Truths About COVID 19. Contagious virus or 5G microwave technology, question mark. And you have to think, have we ever been lied to by our government or corporations? Can you think of any examples? We need to look deeper into what the official story is telling us. This says COVID-19 and the 5G connection. Many epidemiological observations and biological studies indicate that the disease called COVID-19 is actually radiation poisoning caused by exposure to microwaves used in 5G wireless technology. The epidemiology is that COVID-19 first appeared in Wuhan, China, where the city turned on 10,000 5G base stations. It spread to these other countries as 5G rolled out. The biology, COVID-19 and radiation injury, the symptoms are the same. Fever, chills, dry cough, extreme fatigue, loss of taste and smell. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, multi-organ hypercoagulation, hypoxia, lack of oxygen, which also is caused by the mass. And there's a section in this brochure about myths and truths, about the ingredients in the COVID shots. And here's one, and this is pretty serious. Myth, wearing a mask can protect Thank you, you against COVID. Minutes. Not true. I have copies of this I'd like everyone to have and study Thank because this is an minutes. educational place, right? We study, we And that critique. was two minutes. Thank you. No further public comments? All right. We'll move on to our employee organizations. And now is the time where we hear from our employee organizations, and each will have five minutes. We'll start with uh, PVFT. Good evening, board, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, <laughs> the PBFT is proud to advocate for the well being of our members, staff, and students. As the representative for the certificated non management ed educators, we view our students as a central benefactor of the safe, sustainable learning practice we strive to create through the contract language we bargain for. Our working environment is our students' learning environment. I raised both of my children in this district. So when I speak from a personal position, as of like right now, <laughs> I do so with having been a resident of Watsonville and having these two byproducts of our school district. 
And it is a bonus for me that I have the privilege of having been able to impact the lives of many students. I think when I was trying to do the math, I think I've had like over 500 students um, during my years here as an elementary and secondary teacher. That's orgullo. Pride in having witnessed the dedication of hundreds of teachers who wake up every morning during the week to guide our students through our, their academic careers. Providing care and support as our students develop as young ador adults. Emoción. Thrill to see our youth become. Public education is a core foundation of our society, a place where students can begin to discover, discover who they are as a writer, sociologist, a mathematician, an artist, an athlete, a musician, and so on. So it is unfortunate that despite our great efforts and with our audacity of hope as, as we continue to bargain for our unit to provide a salary increase for our membership, one which we know is the reason why we were able to fill a majority of the vacancies than we that we had for classroom positions. Um, this district, some of its people that make decisions still continue with the audacity to make unfortunate decisions that negatively impact its people and students. We understand that declining enrollment is something that looms ahead, that we're living that and we're seeing those numbers. But to take valuable programs away, such as the arts for our elementary students, is unjust. Es injusto. There are two people in this cabinet that are making rash decisions about staffing that is impacting workloads in an unsustain unsustainable manner. Using a staffing formula that whittles students down to numbers in a formula. People are already quitting or will not stay after this year. The PVFT believes the students deserve an enriching education in schools that demonstrate what it is to collaborate and treat its employees with dignity and respect. That's modeling. Our students, in the words of Whitney Houston, are our future. <laughs> so I really hope that as this meeting continues and you see this incredible ending reserve that this district has now, that the um, programs that our students are missing out right now on are um, that it just doesn't match for right now when we talk about mental health, when we talk about the whole child. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Okay. Um, 8.2 CSEA, do we have anybody from CSA here tonight? Anybody from Pavam? Uh, good evening, President Home, trustees, uh, interim superintendent, Mr. Sheckman, cabinet, colleagues. Uh, my name is Rich Moran. I'm proud principal of Minty White Elementary. Um, I'm here just to give a, a snapshot of what we're doing here, I think, as uh, site leaders, as administrators. Um, it's an exciting time of the year um, at our site, at all of our sites as educational leaders. Um, we're already about um, well into five weeks of the school year, so we're already seeing the benefits of our efforts um, during our opening weeks. Um, we've built strong foundations for our education through our implementation of community circles, social emotional learning, uh, big emphasis on strong tier one and tier two efforts in regards to PBIS, as well as our academic routines and proce um, procedures. So all of that's meant to ground our students in the rest of our work for this year. Um, we've moved headlong into the use of our curriculum, including the implementation of our new science curriculum, TWIG, TK through two, um, TK through three at my site, because we had some extra volunteers. Um, we're also finishing up our first round of universal screeners and assessments, and are looking forward to using these data um, to inform student groupings, scaffold instruction for student access and success, create opportunities for a productive struggle, and challenge our students to exceed expectations. Furthermore, many of us are relying on our understanding and implementation of the MTSS process 
Um, these supports and accommodations are helping us to provide the extra support some learners might need in order to develop appropriate social skills, coping skills, attend to instruction, and self-regulate, all of which, again, will further their academic success. Additionally, now that we're moving our students forward at our school sites, um, we're also in the midst of planning events to engage, support, and celebrate our parents, um, including uh, family technology nights, family literacy nights. Um, we have our pending uh, parent conferences coming up as well. And I'm sure each of the elementary sites and secondary sites are also doing additional work, again, to engage and support our families. Um, as educational leaders, as a district, um, we have a number of tools at our disposal, and I feel like we're improving our ability to wield all of those tools for the sake of our students. We're doing much for our students and our community, and yes, um, we have much to do for our students and for our community. And to that end, um, I'd like to take a moment to speak to item 912 and just mention that we're excited about the pending approval of Ms. Claudia Monjaras as our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. She's been an integral component of and a driver behind a myriad of these initiatives, processes, and supports, and I'm confident that her leadership will continue to provide the continuity, the urgency, and the growth that our students and families in PVUSD deserve for years to come. So I want to thank you for your time and thank you for your efforts and contribution to our community, and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, CWA, is tonight the night? <laughs> Not tonight, okay. Um, going on to our action items. Item 9.1, superintendent search, our proposed timeline, and the report will be presented by Marie Sheckman, our intern superintendent of schools, and Eric Andrew. I was like, ready to go. He's there. <laughs> and I basically will turn it over to our colleagues from Leadership and Associates. They've been planning. I put it on the agenda, but they have the presentation. So thank you, folks. Come on. Marie, come on. I thought you had this. First of all, thank you guys so much. I want to tell you how honored and proud I am of you guys for your comments you made earlier about hate and, and what's happening in your community. That takes a lot for you guys to say that, and I appreciate you standing up as a board making those comments so thank you guys so so much appreciate it also appreciate the the words of the kids uh, you, you guys make sure in your meetings that it's about the students and so on along the way and so we really do appreciate that and the great comments that have been made by the various factors here we want to bring to you a uh, timeline but before I do that I want to introduce my colleague Many of you not met her. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself, Blanca? I sure can. Hello, I'm Blanca Cavazos, and I did have an opportunity to meet you before when we presented our proposal, and so I'm very happy to be with you here again, and I thank you for understanding as to why I uh, was not here the last time when my colleague presented. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to working with you and getting to know you and uh, I'm also very excited to see your students here as a former high school principal nothing makes me prouder than seeing students up before the board so thank you so we brought you a timeline earlier and there was a lot of discussion and during that discussion there seems to be have been um, uh, we were trying to come up with our initial schedule is one of pretty a quick timeline and and typical of a leadership associates timeline it was not fast it was just a matter of what we typically do but after listening to a lot of the conversations um, that was going on that night it was it became clearer to me that there's a number of the board members who wanted to slow the process down a little bit we talked a lot about getting the community involved and how we were going to do that and making sure that we had time to advertise to the community members and to make sure we rally them to come out and participate in this process in the various ways. And so we created a new timeline. I do would li I'd like to do a couple of changes. One, we're going to cross out the 26th and make that, uh, oh, it's good, it's not even on there. Perfect, perfect. Uh, the other thing is that we will come back, I know, uh, Vice President Clerk Acosta wanted to make her comments regarding the 
uh, her characteristics and so on after we had done the public comment and that seemed to be something that we had talked about so we will make sure that we've not forgotten that. The other thing we wanted to make sure we did was to ensure that we would reach out to the basic four communities that you talked about and so it would provide opportunities for that along the way. So with that being said, you have the timeline in front of you. We'd like to listen to your comments and thoughts. We believe that this is a good timeline in the sense of it beats the season. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there's typically a search season. It usually starts at about January and goes to June. So we're just a little ahead of that. So that gives you a little bit of an advantage of being able to get top candidates. And yet candidates who are going to announce in December will also have an opportunity to be a part of this process as well. So that's our thinking behind creating this timeline. Great. Uh, do we have any public comments to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Um, I would just like to say thank you guys for being here this evening. Um, one of the questions I always tend to ask when we hand out contracts or any type of funding, who's speaking tonight? Are, is, are there any representatives going to be here? And so I, I'd like to thank you guys. You guys already been here what, two or three times. Yeah. Yeah, I remember your, your colleague when she came, and so I just wanted to say thank you guys for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently attended a meeting with 20 to 30 teachers and classified workers at EA Hall at a school that I represent with Trustee Scout. Mm -hmm. one, of the question, one of the questions that we received was, how is the process going? Um, what's the timeline? And so hopefully some of those teachers are looking at that timeline tonight. And um, you know, they're, they're excited, the community's excited to be part of this process and I would just like to say, you know, thank you guys very much. Um, I'm one of the trustees that agree with others that this should be a, you know, a long process to get the community involved, you know, at least the area that I represent. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say it also too, to our interim superintendent, you know, I know we butted heads a couple times already, but you know I, I like to to say thank you, you know, for having communication and also visiting sites. I think that's important, mm -hmm. and you know, hopefully we continue to work together this year that you're here. And I look forward to it. So I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Trustee Scow. Yes, thank you very much. I think this is a, a pretty solid timeline. Just a follow-up question about can we? On the specifics of reaching out, we talked about the high schools, town hall. Can, is there going to be, are you going to come back with some specifics on that, or do you already have that in mind, or is that coming back to us? Or? Yeah, so we, we will move forward, actually. We, what we'll do is we'll work with the board with uh, creating the, the groups uh, that who you want us to reach out to. I think we have an opportunity to, to pass information. Eva, we will t take a look at that, send it back out to you to s say, hey, do we miss anybody? Or is there another group we need to reach out to? And then we'll create a list and we'll work with our admin and your admin and they'll start to schedule the various groups along the way. Once that's done, <coughs> we will create a report to you that basically will tell you, here's a summary of what we heard on the online, online survey. Here's what we heard from our focus groups and part of that will be used to come back and create a position description based on what the, the board and the community says they wanted to see their next superintendent. So you'll be informed all along the way. Once we start the uh, community outreach, we will start getting information back to the board probably about every 10 days to be able to say, for example, uh, on an online survey, we've got 342 responses already. Uh, uh, in terms of our outreach, we're doing Zoom outreach on this day, we're doing in person on other days, and so we'll be in constant communication. So about every 10 days, you get something back from us saying, here's an update, and that you can share with the, with the community at that point. Could you scroll down a little, please, so the audience and the viewers can see, I mean, uh, the other way, please, so they can see through towards next year in the spring upwards. Thank you for that good specific directive that was clear and understandable. A little, a little more, a little more, a little more with January 12th. At the, okay, perfect, right there, thank you so much. Okay, so it looks like um, there's some room, I think last time I said, I think it'd be great if the best candidate wants to start 
I want to find the best candidate if they want to start in March. Mm -hmm. The best candidate wants to start next June. We have that flexibility because we have a beautiful contract with an excellent interim superintendent. <laughs> and so we have that flexibility. So yes. I think you built that in yes. to this timeline knowing Absolutely. there's some possibilities there. And mm -hmm. so I think that, that looks good to me. Uh, I'll turn it over to my, my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Vice President Costa. Thank you. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I do believe the timeline that you've come up with now is, is better than the, the previous one presented. Um, and, and to your point of what you said, you think it's better, and I, I'm still gonna be on the other side of the, the fence with this with you, mm -hmm. that I don't believe it's better. And mm -hmm. as someone who works in education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, flying these positions, December and January is just really, it's just not the ideal time. January, February, much better. Um, but if you, there's a board majority here, that's fine. With this timeline as presented, I will um, support that um, with a few caveats. Yes, and thank you. I appreciate, Eric, you mentioning about my, right? I, as to my point the last time, right? We have that something that happens every two years and we're coming on to that mm -hmm. in 2024. Mm -hmm. And the board that may be here after December 2024 may be a very well different board. The board Correct. that may be here in December 2026 may very well be a different board. Mm -hmm. Hopefully whoever the superintendent will be, the permanent, mm -hmm. will still be here. Mm -hmm. And so I really don't feel it's this board's superintendent, it's this community's superintendent. And I, th I that echoing that again and again you're going to hear me, I know. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like, I'm tired of hearing you say it, Georgia. Okay, but, you know. I, I just, it, it's our community superintendent. Mm -hmm. And so, and having that input, and I think that you've heeded and heard that now from mm -hmm. this board, that they, we really want that, a, a, a majority of the board, anywho. Um, so, and I appreciate your comment about what I'd said at the last meeting about that um, not wanting to put my comments out there until I hear that. Mm -hmm. And I have that constituency base and our stakeholder base that gives that feedback. And also we unfortunately, due to emergent reasons that evening had two board members who couldn't be here. So right. we haven't heard from there mm -hmm. because of very unforeseen things that happened that evening. Um, so I see you, you, it's not, sketched in here but i heard you articulate mm -hmm. that we'll we'll it will get in here yes, before we move to that process mm -hmm. to bring that back yes. after we've had the time to review and then um, i think to uh trustee Bellano scow's point you uh, that was another question i had with well, well where when because uh, i don't see that etched out here when are those community meetings town halls meetings happening and whatnot but i think you've um if you scroll down you've or up up down, oh, up, up Sorry, Adam, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I was with you the other way. Well. Right. Oh, I mean, are those going to be just those dates? I mean, you're going to reach all those on the 7th, 8th, and 9th? Correct. And if we need to do an extra day, we'll do an extra day because the, the days will be based upon what the board says they would like to see in terms of groups. So we don't have the groups yet. So typically, we do it in one day. And basically, what happens is uh, the two colleagues are in two different rooms. And all day, starting 30 minutes apart, we start at maybe 8 or 8.30, and we go as long as we can to 5, and then at 5 o'clock, we have a town meeting. So that's typically how we've done it. Mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of success doing it that way. We've actually given you three days, minimally, to do the same thing. And so we feel like the groups will be able to do that. We'll be able to hit, if you had 30, 40, 50 groups, we think in those three days, we'd be able to hit everybody. And we are finding also kind of across the board as we talk to our colleagues, we had a meeting just this, this week, and uh, that more people really prefer to do the survey. Um, they, they really like doing the survey, and if you think about it, they can do it at any time. And so you'll be getting those numbers, not just, uh, it won't just be numbers, but it will also, we will share with you what percentage of those numbers were from staff, what percentage were from parents, just so that you can, as we go through the process, you can get a picture of who is participating. We will also share with you 
uh, the numbers of the that are in the groups that we're meeting with on Zoom and the numbers of people that we're meeting with in person so that you can again start seeing who it is that's participating in um, in these different types of meetings and in those numbers will it have the percentage of result for the input for each group the you know for the characteristics I'm thinking that's what you're talking about yes, right they'll they'll get the same the very same each group gets the right exact we same saw that that Eric presented and, right. and so so it'll be broken down for each group and what group said this to question one two three four correct that's from that's for the online survey not for the focus groups okay. the focus groups will be group one teachers here's what they said group two classified here's what they said group three students okay. here's what they said That's group and so we'll just go and oftentimes as we mentioned we typically have between 20 and 40 groups so you get a chance to see here's what some of them have said along the way keeping in mind oftentimes there the, the, there's some confidentiality issues so people want to know okay uh, if I say this as a teacher, is there going to be any repercussions? So we, we do want to keep that in mind as well. But we, you'll get the list that says, here are the groups, here's what they said. And with regards to the town halls, we had talked about at a minimum four, possibly five Correct. different. Aptos is one, Pajaro Valley High School is another, Watsonville, Watsonville is High another, School is and another, the, and Pajaro Middle School, and then even Renaissance High School, I believe, deserves that mm -hmm. you know recognition. Yeah. So. Um, and what we typically do in those settings, we just go to the school. So uh, during that time frame, during that day, we say, okay, we're going to be at this school on this day because we want to make it convenient for the, the students. We'll go to this school in an, uh, at another time. And so we do that literally in person at the school site. And that's good. Uh, but my question to that would be, how are you engaging the parents if the parents are working during the day? That's why we have the online survey. That's why we have community meetings in the evening. Okay. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I'm still not a fan of the December 4th, January 8th. I would prefer to see that like January 8th than February something. I don't the beginning of February. I can't think of a date in the beginning of February. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day, February 14th. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean that, that would be my one caveat I, ideal to this um, uh, for the advertisement and recruitment portion of it. Um, and other than that, the only other thing I'd like to add is that you, um, in, in looking to make a motion about approving this, that this isn't like something that is like literally set in stone that it could have the caveat of that you know per the board's discretion there can be manipulation and change to it per the board here's the reality this is for the board but it's also for the candidates in our recruiting they're going to want to know when is the time what is the timeline when are we going to be at recruiting when are you going to have the uh, the deadline and, and some of those types of things and as I mentioned earlier if we go through your list and we say hey we need another day or we need another meeting we make that change it's just, so some of this it will be on the run based on the communities that we're in this just gives us a guideline of, of here's where we're going to go and here's why we want to do it this way and we've had a lot of success doing it this way but we there's very few timelines that are etched in stone because there's always some nuances in a community that we want to make sure we, we touch on. Okay, and I, I hear that. So um, then my request would just be that we could change the date from December 4th and January 8th to January 8th and February 5th. December 4th, January 8th are our, that's when we advertise in our at Cal in our magazines. That's where the candidates are going to be seeing. Uh, here's your position. Here is the uh, uh, position description. Here is the salary range. That's for them, not for us or the board. Yes, but you're closing the deadline to apply for a preferred deadline application as January 12th at 5 p.m. Correct. So, okay. 
Then there how are about candidates already looking at the position? We've already been contacted. And I'm, I'm candidates that want to know when when sure. is this going to happen? Sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm also just alluding back to what Eric said. I mean that. that and it is, it is a fact known that January and February are the ideal times that most of the prime candidates are looking. And if those candidates are still looking and interested, I think they'd be willing to look to apply, if not by the January 12th, then let's say February 16th. I, I don't honestly see that a one, <laughs> two, three, four week, five week bump is gonna make that dramatic difference. So we've, we're, I'm, I'm sorry. I've heard, I've heard your point. Yeah. And I, I just want to hear them response okay. to that. Thank so you. our response to that would be this, that we will send this out to a, over a thousand current superintendent and assistant superintendents immediately. People are always looking. EdCal comes out twice a month. People will start reading the back page first. So anybody in the field, and you can ask your own colleagues here in the field knows, this comes out every two weeks and they look for jobs specifically. Uh, in terms of that timeline and so on, we, we think it's a, it's a solid timeline. We, we do okay. based on our, our experience. Great, and I wanna open it up to other comments. We can wrap up to follow up if we have some. Trustee DeSerpe, did you have some comments? Yeah, I think this is a solid timeline. You, you, you're, you, this is what you do, you guys are experts at this. I feel like we've already moved the timeline um, in response to some trustees asking for that to happen. And this looks great to me. And we also know that for some reason, if we don't get qualified candidates, that we could go out again. So I'm very comfortable with this and I'd like to make a motion to approve tonight. I also wanted to say that um, at the last meeting, you know, as a board, we discussed pushing it back by a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and with this timeline, you know, where we talked about, you know, trying to actually find somebody mm -hmm. by January. And, you know, this, this new timeline is pushing it back by a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And at first, I had some apprehension about mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. and missing out on good candidates. And I, I will, I, you know, it's like I had, I was concerned. I was concerned about the impact that would have on mm -hmm. our district. I was concerned about, you know, I know we have a contract with you, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, but I, I appreciate, you know, in, you know, I've had conversations and, mm -hmm. and I appreciate, you know, the, the reassurances that I've had and the, the additional information I've been able to get. And it's like, I feel assured that we'll be able to find, you know, good candidates. And I appreciate the compromise. Thank you. That this offers. And I think it's in line with what was discussed, you know, at the last meeting. Thanks. So thank you. Mr. Trustee Dodge Jr. I know we have a motion. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, Hopefully our student trustee, you know, I know she has a voice for the high school. I, I, I know my daughter, she intends once in a while. I know she has her own opinion too. Hopefully, you know, I, I know trustee Soda represents another county and sometimes that tends to get overlooked. So hopefully, you know, trustee Soto, you know, can let mm -hmm. you know about the schools he represents in Monterey County. Mm -hmm. And I know he'd be happy to tell you that. And um, I just wanted to quickly, if. If I can ask if you could somehow reach out to the Watsonville City Council. Uh, I know my trustee area, I have the supervisor mm -hmm. in my area. I have three city council members in my area and I share a district with five out of seven Watsonville City Council districts. Mm -hmm. And so they all have their own opinions and hopefully, so I just wanted to say okay. that, thank so you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Uh, trustee Scott? I just wanted to make a suggestion on the uh, community meetings and at the last meeting you might have heard some comments from me suggesting we should have some ownership and what I meant and the marketing of that because mm -hmm. that the district yeah. should have the full weight of the marketing and if there's a way we could provide if there's a way we always talk about uh, we never for those watching we would love to have the public come more often we already have any, the public show up mm -hmm. and so if there's a problem with child care if we need to get some pizza there I'm for that uh, so we can make these meetings more accessible because we hardly have ever parents come to our meetings mm -hmm. and we'd like to have parents come to our meetings so I just want to I don't know just want to throw that out there that I would be supportive of that okay. Thank you. I just have another uh, follow-up question from the last meeting actually uh, another group that was identified was our um, in our Hispanic community the Oaxacan group and with their dialect and language I don't also see that being addressed here in this new timeline? Well, they will be part of the 7th, 8th, or 9th 
group. And so we'll reach out to, to that group as a part of one of those subgroups that are there. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 6-1. All right, item 9.2, salary super, uh, superintendent salary range report will be presented by. Well, the report was put together by Eva and I, and we get to say, carry on. Yes. <laughs> but now the topic is salary. Thank you so much. You're yes. welcome. Thank you. Yes. I think we sent you a few uh, examples of salaries in your community, and this is where the board comes together to determine what they believe is a salary range for the next superintendent. Um, again, this is just a range, but we want direction from the board as to what you feel is a good salary range for the incoming superintendent. Do we have any public comment to this item? Yes, we do. We have two, Bill Beecher and Chris Webb. Good evening. How many of you believe that Dr. Rodriguez's salary was 223000 a year? I'm shocked. I don't believe it, because I know it was more than that. So if her salary, which is on these pages, is wrong, how do I know any of the other salaries are right? I don't. I don't have a lot of faith in them. Also, 16 of these schools have less than a thousand students. Why would we even look at what they pay? Because our district is so much bigger. I mean, the bigger the district, you've got to pay more for a superintendent. Why are we comparing ourselves to Gilroy or some other districts that have comparable size? And what do they pay? The other thing that's missing in this comparison is what kind of academic performance are these districts having? I think that's kind of relevant. Now, when, <clears throat> when you were sworn in as trustees, you took an oath to provide our students the best education that we can provide. In pursuit of that, you need to hire the best candidate available. If you're trying to save some money by having a real low ball set of numbers around 200,000, it's a fool's errand. If you save $200,000 by doing this, that amounts to $200 per year per teacher. You haven't saved anything to try to fatten up the teachers. If, you're ha if you are having serious surgery, you do not find the cheapest surgeon, you find the best one. That is why you need to hire a superintendent is the best one that's out there, and you've got to be willing to pay top dollar because our students deserve it, and you have an obligation to provide that. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm for paying top dollar on this as as long as we get um, positive cultural change and somebody who's not just gonna go with the status quo um, that's proven faulty too often we change leadership and then we just we don't really change our processes um, so so contingent on that and contingent on um, leadership where they're in touch with the circumstances we have meaning like we recognize there's a teacher shortage. We just asked a lot of our teachers last year in terms of subbing. It was maybe uh, not the most respectful thing to attack them for using their PN days around the holiday. Um, maybe we should be focused on having paying somebody who's, who's wise enough to realize that we, we want to retain people. We can't be doing that. We need to find ways to innovate and be different. Um, also, it, when you do those things, you basically force a culture of lying from your staff, um, you, like they, maybe they don't use a PN day, they use a sick day instead, and uh, that just makes it harder to find subs. So it's, it's not collaborative in that way. Um, the other thing I would say on like salary is that uh, the car allowance, I, I feel like the, that the car is like a symbol of, of, of what we have with, with our leader, and, and I'd like to see us be a green district, innovative, um, leading, so, I, w I would like to see that we don't pay for somebody to drive around a car that maybe 
is is just like old fashioned, not not green. Um, also, with that, one other thing I would say is, if we on that on that PN day thing, if we were to like keep attacking teachers for those, um, and the, the new superintendent did that and favored that kind of leadership, that kind of thing makes me want to do a sick out. I'm just throwing that out there. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? So who gathered this information? Was this you guys or was it our district? This is from us. That's this from is you about guys. a year old. A year old. And so it probably, uh, we, we take a look at it. Superintendents and you guys have experiences have received between a 5 and a 10% raise over the course of the year. This is a base salary, does not include any of the other benefits such as your health benefits, such as your car allowance, some people have phone allowances, some have insurance policies. So this is just, some have stipends for doctorates, um, master's degrees, et cetera. So this is based solely on salary. And this is information that is, this is information that is gathered by the state. And so it's not information that we gather we got that from the state and then we pulled out the, the uh, districts that were relevant to this area thank you and it's important to note superintendent salaries are location 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 it has very little to do with the size of a district it really doesn't if you were in santa clara county the average is going to be between 270 and 330 even the smaller districts if you go to San Mateo, it goes up more. If you're in LA County, it's the same thing. So we basically took from the state's database, the, the districts that are kind of in your area to give us a sense of, okay, here's what, what people around you are paying at that point. Any other trustees? I know at the, uh, Vice President Acosta? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I fact-checked you. And, and you are correct um, because the backup did show that it is, this was for 2022, 2023 school year. Um, and our former superintendent was making 222832000 That is also what's on her contract. It dated August 24th, 2022, 222832000 So I do trust your numbers. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, and I do have some input with regards to the numbers and, and my thought process in going through this and also feedback from constituents that I've already spoken to that have reached out to me to give me their input. Um, and, and thank you for elaborating on how you came up with that 7%, right? Mm -hmm. a, a sort of an average between the five and the 10, mm -hmm. um, which I think is fair and respectable and that these salaries did not, because they were the 2022, 2023 school year did not reflect the potential 7% increase right which Correct. could have been five could have been ten Correct. seven conservatively mm -hmm. perfect um, and so in looking at these uh, one of the things that um, was brought to my attention by some constituents and it was also popped out to me um, I do have a concern and an issue with um, a superintendent of school of a local school district making potentially more than the county COE superintendent of schools right um, so that was something that was flagged and so I looked at right specific to Santa Cruz County Office of Ed our superintendent of schools is 2022-23 making 237.38 and with the seven percent that's it's about 16 and a half thousand pay raise at 253 630 would be respective at this point um, and then looking at Carmel um, and and looking through I mean I'm sorry looking at through the rest of the schools in Santa Cruz County the schools pay the local school districts mm -hmm. the 10 that sit under that umbrella mm -hmm. pay below what the county COE makes mm -hmm. and looking at Monterey County to the other side there were only two school districts that were outliers to that, which aren't really comparable to PBUSD based on their budget formula, and specifically Carmel, mm -hmm. that makes more than the Monterey County COE Superintendent of Schools. So my 
you know, range is definitely to be in respect of below that. I don't believe that a sitting superintendent of a, a local school district should be making more potentially than the sitting superintendent um, of the local county of office of education. So that was a bit of my thought process there. And I'm going to, before my president gets after me again, I'm going to turn it back and let her call on somebody else. And if I have another comment, I'll wait to make that call. Do any other trustees have anything they want to add? I know at the last, at the, or at the meeting we had, we talked about a range of, you know, 240 to 270, but we could certainly mm -hmm. adjust if someone wanted to make a motion you know, to that effect. I, I would like to, um, I, thank you, President yeah. Holm. I'd like to um, make a motion. I would like to look, and I think we had that conversation about looking at this range, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't think we could say this is it because we don't know who this person is going to be, what qualifications they're going to have, do they, do they have their ED, do they have a PhD, do they only have a master's? Experience, fit, all that, right. Do they fit mm -hmm. all this criteria that the community has come up with? right every you know boom 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 mm -hmm. right so I think a range is appropriate um, with that guidance and given my already previous comment to this subject I think that a range is somewhere between and so do you want me to say it as a motion or should I say what I'm thinking um, well, it, we can, I mean, between between 225,000 and 250,000 cap I think is is fair is my thought process so if I'll it, it, I'm glad to make that into a motion and let it maybe be shot down but I don't. So do, do we want to, do people want to discuss it sure go ahead I'm okay with that range if we find somebody we really want and we think they're qual we don't we can we can we can negotiate that later so I'm, I'm okay with that range with the end if we need to negotiate later. We, we don't I, tie our hands. I think, per my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, because you know it's only happened once or twice. But it <laughs> um, I love it. Isn't that what I mean? The range that we put out, we have to be within that parameter. Is that correct? You need to be close to it. Uh, sometimes boards will go up or down depending on. So we have that correct. flexibility. So you do have some flexibility with that. Okay. And mm -hmm. not to jump on you, but sure. we did have some other hands oh, raised. Uh, I would just like to second Trustee Acosta's motion. Okay. Let me formalize that into a motion first. So I'll make a motion <laughs> to approve um, this item 9.2 with a salary range of 225000 to 250000 Well, i like to second that motion, but I think you're be being generous. But I'll second that motion. All right. <laughs> so I do have. We do have more comments before we take a vote. Go ahead, Trustee Deserpa. Were Were you two prepared to come forward tonight with a recommendation about what the range should be? Or Not a, no. We don't do that because we don't know your finances uh, and what other conditions are happening in the district that could affect it. So we typically do not get involved. We leave this totally to the board, and then once the board makes this decision that we can say that makes sense to us or that it doesn't okay but it's a total board's decision well with all due respect to trustee acosta the superintendent of this district has far more responsibility than the coe superintendent period and i love ferris sabah and everything that the coe does but being a superintendent at this district is, I think, a much bigger job. Um, so I, I, I will support the range as long as we know that it can be negotiated for the right candidate. If there's a candidate who's making more, who's down in San Diego, who would like to come here, I think we should be able to um, change our minds on the range if that's the candidate that we want. And I also just want to, you know, this is, just the salary. Mm -hmm. This is not the yes, complete salary contract. only. Base salary. Yeah. Right. To your point, President Holmes, yeah. this does not include the stipend, correct? Any, that potential, and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Just, just a quick comment. Um, I, ag I agree that, of course, we want the best superintendent that we can get for our students. Mm -hmm. 
but we also have a responsibility to make sure we can afford to pay our teachers what they deserve and our CSEA workers what they deserve. And if we're going to just give this outlandish salary, then we won't be able to do that. So I definitely agree with this range. And I also feel it's a little generous, but like I said, I'll, I'll agree with this. All right. Well, and I, I'd just like to add, we do have an item further down the agenda, right, about a special study st session um, that our current superintendent has proposed. And I think that bringing this back as part of that conversation at that special study session would be a good, so the board can um, have an analysis of what the impact of this potential salary range will be on the fiscal level to this district. Okay. Well, we have a first and a second. And if there's no further comment, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. And again, that, that number is? Uh, 225 to 250. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, folks. All right, um, 9.3, resolution 2324-06, recognizing Latinx uh, Heritage Month report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. Thank you. Good evening, President Home Board Trustees and Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. Um, I am honored this evening to present to you resolution 2324-06, recognizing Latinx Latine Heritage Month. This annual observance serves as a powerful testament to the invaluable contributions of Latinx, Latine individuals and com communities to our nation's rich tapestry. It is an opportunity for us to honor the diverse histories, cultures, and achievements of Latinx, Latine in the Pajaro Valley, our community in the United States, and to reaffirm our commitment to inclusivity and diversity. In the face of ongoing challenges, barriers, and racism, Latinx, Latine communities have continued to demonstrate resilience, unity, and a commitment to shaping a brighter future for themselves and for all Americans. The term Latinx derives itself from gender inclusion and subsequently changed to Latine to include gender and indigenous communities. I'm going to read um, parts of the resolution. The resolution 232406 states, whereas Pajaro Valley Unified Schools District takes pride in joining citizens throughout the country in recognizing September 5th through October 15th, 2023 as National Latinx Latine Heritage Month, and whereas the 2023 theme for the month is prosperity, power, and progress, recognizing the significant achievements of the Latinx Latine community in the economic and political industries. And whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District in its continued effort to honor Latinx, Latine heritage and during this month enhance equity and diversity through art, literature, and celebrations of the diversity within the Latinx, Latine community. And now therefore it be resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District continues to partner with our community for events and to provide activities in the classroom where students talk about their identity and continue to and identity and culture and to continue the historical traditions that have been part of our community as in the ethnic studies courses do. Now therefore be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will acknowledge supports needed for all of our families including farm workers to ensure that the children of our families will have access to equitable educational opportunities. Now therefore be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will highlight local Latinx, Latine, cultural artists, storytellers, historians, and intentionally use literature that reflects our students whenever possible. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District proclaims September 15th through October 15th, 2023, as Latinx, Latine Heritage Month, and is pleased to share in this special annual tribute by learning and celebrating the generations of Latinx, Latine, who have positively influenced and enriched our nation, our society, and our community. Thank you, and um, starting tomorrow on our website, we will have the resources for our community, for our educators, and for our students to use throughout the entire year um, within the classrooms and without to continually celebrate and honor our Latinx, Latine community. And with that, I ask for approval of the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Do we have any discussion from the board? 
And that includes our student trustee. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you ever have any, you know, comments for the, you please feel free to, to comment as you wish. You're welcome. Um, I'll make a motion to oh. approve. All right. So, yeah, thank you. I, I'm going to support this. The spirit of this is very important, and um, you know, it's, it's just my observation, and, and it's personal maybe, but a major, you know, four of us on this board have Mexican heritage, which is a pretty cool thing for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, Latinx and Latinair are more university-oriented terms that are not often heard in our communities, but I understand the spirit of why they're being used, but they're certainly not a, something we hear in the community. Um, but I, I'll support this and second the motion. Any other comments? All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. All right. Going on to item 9.4, our approved resolution 232408, acknowledging September 10th through September 16th, 2023, as Suicide Prevention Awareness Week and September as Suicide Prevention Month. The report will be presented by Kristen McLean, our coordinator of counseling programs. Good evening, uh, Interim Superintendent Mr. Sheckman, President Holm, and PVUSD Board of Trustees. My name is Chrissy McLean, Coordinator of Counseling Programs, and I'm honored to present this proclamation to you today. Um, the week of September 10th through 16th, 2023, is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week, and September 2023 is National Suicide Prevention Month. PVUSD is dedicated to reducing the stigma around mental health issues and suicide, creating safe spaces, working with community partners, and providing support for students at every opportunity. School counselors in PVUSD utilize September to educate students about resources, ensure students know where to ask for help, and recognize when their friends may need help. This resolution is yet another way to ensure that students and members of the community know that if they are thinking about suicide, they are not alone, and that there are resources for them. With that, I will read a few portions of the proclamation. Whereas the week of September 10, 16, 2023 is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week, the Septem and September 2023 is National Suicide Prevention Month, when millions of people around the world join their voices to share a message of hope and healing. Whereas talking about suicide reduces the stigma and may help those feeling alone to reach out for help. And whereas help and supports are available 24-7 via phone call, text, or chat from the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Whereas according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, among teenage girls, 30% said they seriously considered attempting suicide, up almost 60% from a decade ago. And whereas according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, almost half of LGBTQ plus students said they had seriously considered a suicide attempt. And whereas suicide is preventable, as nine out of 10 suicide attempt survivors do not go on to die by suicide. And whereas school counselors, mental health clinicians, administrators, staff, and our mental health partners offer a range of services which prevent and intervene in suicide thoughts and plans amongst PBUSD students. Now therefore be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is committed to recognizing suicide as a preventable national, state, and local public health problem. Supporting the declaration that suicide prevention should be a priority, developing and implementing strategies to increase access to quality mental health, substance abuse, and suicide prevention services, training 100 plus staff members in applied suicide intervention skills training, creating a suicide safer community, both within our schools and our neighborhoods. So therefore be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognize September 10th, 2023 to September 16th as Suicide Prevention Awareness Week and September as Suicide Prevention Month. Um, so with that, I um, ask for approval of this resolution. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. One, Michael Berman.
Good evening, President Home, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Sheckman, and members of the community. Um, I'd like to state my appreciation for this acknowledgement. Um, I attended the ASSIST training for suicide prevention in July um, and was frankly very anxious and fearful about the topic of suicide. Um, and, I'm, and I still am, um, though I feel equipped with tools and strategies. Um, and the training taught me <coughs> how important it is to name that which creates this fear. So thank you for considering this resolution to recognize Suicide Prevention Awareness Week and Month. Um, and I highly encourage all of my colleagues in PBUSD to attend the, the ASSIST training that Chrissy offers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? Thank you, Chrissy. That's, that's a very important topic in, in particular for our um, kids that are uh, GLBTQI in questioning. Um, so I appreciate you bringing it forward. I'm a mental health professional. Much of my career I spent with people that were feeling uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. And I never really learned to ask directly until I went through a training probably about 10 years ago. And now I've trained all of my staff to ask directly because mm -hmm. you'll, get a, you'll get an answer sometimes that you don't want to hear, but you can intervene. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to ask people directly, do you feel suicidal or have you thought about it? Mm -hmm. People will tell you and then you'll know how to move on from there and give them, give them the help that they really need. So anyway, thank you for bringing this forward and I'd like to make a motion to approve. Any further discussion? And for a second, I just wanted to add, um, you know, just for such a long time, there was such a stigma and so many misconceptions mm -hmm. about um, suicide and the factors that led to it. And, uh, you know, what Trustee DeSerpa, you know, spoke about, it's just the idea that if we avoided the topic, that it would somehow make it better. And, you know, you know, close friends of mine have been affected by partners or loved ones who died by suicide. And just the impact that that's had. And for people I know who are survivors, and just the, the, the isolation that was leading them to an attempt. And again, what Trustee DeSerpa said, it was just the, the question that somebody asked. You know, was it they, you know, being seen and heard? And it is an uncomfortable topic. And, and you know, Mr. Berman, I want to acknowledge, you know, the bravery in, in, in being able to say, it's like, yeah, this is an uncomfortable topic, especially for a lot of us who, you know, grew up, you know, in, in, in a time and an era where you don't talk about mental health as a health issue. Um, and it is so important to talk about this because this conversation does save lives. And, you know, maybe the life that, you know, we make a difference on by having these conversations, who knows what that leads to in the future. So, so thank you. We have a first and a second. I'll go ahead and call by all means. Yeah, thanks, Chrissy, for bringing this forward. Um, I know tonight it pertains to students and that's what we're recognizing, but I'd also like to acknowledge the veterans out there that are affected. Um, you know, I heard a commentary from a gentleman saying that, you know, you transition from military life where you're 25 years old and you're in charge of people's lives and millions of, <coughs> excuse me, millions of dollars worth of equipment. And then you transition out of that lifestyle and you're stacking sodas on a shelf. You know, so that uh, level of responsibility kind of drops and uh, takes a chip at your ego. And, um, you know, it, it causes things to you. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people out there that have uh, gone to many uh, theaters lately in the last 20 years. You know, as much as we've been involved with all over the world, there's thousands and or probably millions of veterans out there. 
and that are, you know, dealing with this kind of situation. You know, I personally have some friends that, uh, you know, that transitioned out as well, and, you know, we'll get together every now and then and talk about things, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty serious subject, it's, and it's, uh, it, it needs to be recognized, it needs to be talked about, and it needs to be handled. So thank you. All right. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, President. Thank you. All right. Um, 9.5, our Bond Oversight Committee uh, presentation and Measure L audit report presented by Clint Rucker. Thank you, Board of Trustees, President Holm, and Superintendent Sheckman. Um, yes, I'm here to present both our Bond Citizen Citizens Oversight Committee presentation that was approved by the um, committee at our last meeting, as well as our Measure L um, bond audit. So I'll start off with the audit just briefly. We did have actually a very good audit. Unfortunately, there was one finding. Um, it's not actually too bad of a finding in terms of what happened. What ended up happening is a payable should have been set up for uh, the prior year due to a project that started in June and actually was completed in July. So typically the way that we think in a school district is if we receive it in that year, we pay it in that year. Unfortunately, projects are a little bit different. You have to actually look at when they started and when they finished, how much work was done. So the auditor did deem you should actually have set up a payable. So no dollar amount was incorrect. Everything ended up being the same, just moving it from one year to another. So that was in there. Um, Colleen, when she was still here, did work with our um, manager of accounting to kind of explain that process to her so that moving forward she knows when it comes to projects, just make sure that we're really looking at when they start and when they complete. So with that, I'm going to move on to our Bond Citizen Oversight Committee presentation. I do, um, hiding in the back, have Richard Reed, who used to be with us. Um, you may remember him as our uh, Director of Maintenance. Come on up. Yeah, Richard. Um, he's now actually right now the chair of our Citizen Oversight Committee. So he's here representing the committee alongside me. And again, this is uh, a presentation we have to do every year. It's required by our bond. It actually goes to the Citizens Oversight Committee first, which we went to on July 18th. They approve it to be presented to the board. So the board's informed of what we've been doing with Measure L. Um, I don't think Richard's going to say anything. He's just going to stand and look pretty. He does that well. Um, but he wanted to be here for moral support, so I do appreciate it. Um, just an update on, if you're not aware of who sits on our bond COC, it, these are the individuals. Um, Bill, of course, jetted out on us to not also help us present, but he was here. And all of the individuals, we've really appreciated their support in helping us with this committee. So just to talk about the projects that we've uh, gone through in 22-23 and what we've completed, uh, here's a list. I won't go through them extensively. I will kind of point out some I know. The Minty White uh, Portables, we had been waiting for a very long time. Richard was very excited, I know, to see that get completed. Um, Rolling Hills, the bleachers. Uh, just shout out on that one, because that was one of the very first projects that our Director of Purchasing, Rich Ariano, oversaw. So I know he's very proud of that one. But a lot of great projects actually completed in 22-23. Um, just to give you some vi visuals of what we get to see, we get to see Alianza's new portables here. We're going to see Bradley's new parking lot, which was quite the project. We had a lot of work with the city on that one after we started it, but looks a lot better now, has a much better streamlined flow of traffic for our students and parents. Hall Elementary, which I love the beautiful shot they got of this. Um, I think Sergio and his team have really enjoyed the drone they've been using and getting nice drone shots, but they do look pretty amazing. Um, but Hall, I mean, what a difference. If you saw Hall prior, you remember, I know Trustee Soto does, big change from what it used to look like. Um, as I m mentioned, Minty White got those new portables in there. Much nicer, you can see top right was that old portable that, um, you know, I, I don't want to try and date it, but you can see the new ones there look much cleaner. Renaissance High, we were able to paint, do the painting and the paving. Again, we get one of those nice drone shots showing the new parking lot as well as the painted buildings. As I mentioned, the gym bleachers, uh, old, old ones on the left, those new ones with the Rolling Hills colors on the right look much better, actually usable. Students love them. 
And looking at our current Measure All projects that we have designated right now, um, right now we just have Starlight doing their shade structure and Cesar Chavez doing the hillside stabilization. The reason we don't have a lot of Measure All projects at this moment, as you all know, you approved those ESSER projects. That, those have a much stricter timeline, so trying to jump and get those done is a little bit tighter. We do have some other projects that are in the works we're talking about. Doesn't mean we aren't looking at them, it's just these are the two that are actively going right now and have someone assigned. So looking at the remaining funds, here's what we have for the sites. A um, Couple ones I wanna point out, um, Cesar Chavez has quite a bit of funds left. They are looking at doing some blacktop repairs. If you remember going to Cesar Chavez recently, their blacktop kinda has a unique basketball court where they have roots popping out and it's, um, I don't know if they were trying to invent a new type of basketball game with like traps and things like that, but that's kind of what it looks like. Um, unfortunately, the damage is due to trees and very large trees. And of course, whenever we're dealing with trees, it's a very delicate situation of how we can actually repair the um, blacktop, but also keep those trees going. So that one's been a bit of a tough issue to look at. The other one I just want to point out, which is great, is um, Wattsville High. We are looking at using some of those dollars for their field alongside their um, their ESSER project. And then Rolling Hills, we're actually in the works with the city. They actually just passed through their COC um, the ability to help us build a field at Rolling Hills. So in conjunction with them, they will actually be putting up millions of dollars to be able to build a field there for the community as well as our students. That'll be brought to build the board before we do anything with that project, but it's great to see that they're willing to actually help out and then we'll use some of our remaining Measure L projects for that as well, funding. And that's it, and if you have any questions, we're both here, happy to answer. Great, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Flores? I have a question actually, yeah. can you go back one slide? Yeah, of course. I'm just, why isn't H.A. Hyde on there, I'm just curious. Are they, do they use up all their money? Correct. Or? Okay. Correct. So these are the ones that have remaining Measure L funds that didn't end up using the, all of their funds. And how was it decided how much each school would get? That was. I wasn't here then. Sorry. That's good. That was determined during the Measure L 2020, 2012 bond. I wasn't here either. Okay. But um, yeah, they, they allocated based on student numbers as well as needs for each site. Mm -hmm. um, some sites just had projects that they were they weren't necessarily as complex or they knew exactly what they wanted to do and were able to get them in. That's why some sites ended up finishing earlier than other sites. For example, um, PV High was one of the sites that, for the board members who remember, wanted to do a, um, like a performing arts center and we're keeping some of the money for that, but the field they ended up doing came in a lot higher than they had anticipated. And then the Performing Arts Center, when they got the quote for it, was almost like $12 million. And they said, oh, we don't have enough Measure L for that. So then they kind of got in this weird spot where they have a lot of Measure L remaining, but nothing on their list of desires kind of fit in that dollar amount. Mm. Vice President Acosta? I have a, a, a question. Our um, old Salci Puedes campus isn't on there either. Is that because funds were used up or there's some, something different because there's two Ale charter schools based but Aleanda? still are a facility? Yeah, Alianza and WCSA use their measure all funds. It's so um, okay. it, earlier, and I'll just go back real quick, Alianza actually got new portables last year and they used the remainder of their measure all on those portables. And the, that water tower that was put out there, was that part measure L? I believe back when it was put in, it was. Okay. Trustee Dodge Jr. I just like to say thank you, Clint. You know for what you you've done. You know for the Watson area, you moved right away with the field. You know as soon as I, you you worked on the field, those portables at Mini Way, and I just wanted to acknowledge you and say thank you for that. And Mr. Moran, you still have a little bit of money. I think you might have left. So there you go. Thank you. Anyone from this side of the room? Uh, it, Thank you for this presentation. Um, it just, I just can't help but ask, what, what, can you remind me where we are in the process in talking about bond, another, in the next infrastructure Future. bond? Future yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you may recall or not, um, a few board meetings back, I can't remember exactly when it was, uh, Dale Scott uh, came up with kind of the timeline where what it would look like if we wanted to go out for a bond. What he's done actually last month they started doing some straw polling. So going out, asking the community, would you be in support of a bond 
for 2024 for PVUSD. They have gathered all their data. They're working right now to kind of consolidate consolidate that data so we can bring it back to the board to share with you what the voters' interest was in the bond. That'll kind of determine next steps of if the board wants to continue forward or not. So the board hasn't made any decision to go for a bond or not, just the decision to pull the community and see interest. All right. And I know there have been um, concerns about the roofs at some of the Aptos Junior High uh, mm -hmm. buildings particularly the ones that are not the not the gym itself but the buildings that are adjacent to the gym like you know some of the classrooms like the arts classrooms and I think some of the science classrooms and what are the plans for the remaining measure L funds because I know that what's left is not sufficient for the roof project but what options do we have yeah so I've talked to her Linda a bit about this for example the NPR one of the uh, roofs they could do it would be about 300 to 400,000 to actually do like a weather weld coating on it so not to replace the entire roof but to recoat it to ensure there's no leaks or damages that would be an option potentially for some of the other roofing uh, other roofs at Aptos Jr. which may fit in their measure mm -hmm. I know her has been meeting with Aptos Jr. school site council to kind of discuss the options so really right now their measure is sitting with their school site council of what would you like to look at once they make a determination if it's within the scope of original measure L um, we'll bring it to the COC more as an informational item if they want to do something that measure L really wasn't intended for by the voters originally that's where we'll bring it to COC and actually ask if they can use their dollars for that okay great and in the past I know um, I, I can't remember if you already if you mentioned that in your initial comment so my apologies but um we've had like tours of like the measurable mm -hmm. projects are we planning on doing that anytime soon Again? um so we haven't planned tour though i would be happy to set one up and as well i think the sr projects would be really good to see as well because i think um, the board did a great job of assigning those extra dollars to be able to put into our facilities so i think showing off some of the good work that that did even though those those aren't the um you know, showstoppers, we like them right. to be, a lot of them are more structural. It's still sometimes nice to just see what, where those dollars went and how they've improved the campus. Because I know, you know, when it, you know, I, the first tour I got to go on when it was when I was just still a candidate and I wasn't a tr sitting trustee, but, you know, even going on some of those tours as a sitting trustee, you know, before kind of the pandemic shut things down. Mm -hmm. But um, those tours were so good at just also, you know, giving trustees and other community members and stakeholders an opportunity to really see our sites, the good that we're doing, and also kind of see like, oh, those are some things that need to be worked on. You know, it, it's, it's, but seeing it all in one, like having that one day, to kind of see that, get that bigger picture, that, that comprehensive picture was really useful, and I, I'd love to see that happen again. Did I see, okay. Yeah, I have a question, a couple questions. Sure. So are all of the ESSER dollars already assigned and spoken for and s basically spent? Yeah, so okay. they uh, haven't all been spent, but they've all been assigned based on the needs for each site that were determined by our uh, maintenance and operations as well as our planning department. We brought those to board showing kind of the major three at each site and we based on the dollars that we had allocated, um, try to allocate as evenly as possible, but based on the major need for each site. And um, in terms of forecasting, do we expect any further dollars like ESSER to be coming from the state or federal? Um, I cannot say. I don't know if we'll see any more that. We always get the OP OPSC dollars. Unfortunately, as I've mentioned before, those are a match. So it requires, it requires us to do a project and then actually submit to try and get the dollars back. The nice thing is with the ESSER, some of the ESSER projects, we actually are able to put those in and actually request the match, um, but OPSC typically has a, you know, five-year wait or so on project. I mean, we just got some money back from H an HA High project that was years and years ago. So that was my next question, <clears throat> because I know a lot of these shovel-ready projects, we, I thought we had submitted, submitted for the, I guess, for the match. Mm -hmm. I thought it was to the DSA, but now it's, you're saying it's It's OP OPSC, the Office OPSC. of Public School Construction. Okay, because I thought, like, for example, the Pajaro Valley Field and, and all of those projects were in line to, to get some money back. I'll have to check um, which projects we still have in line with um, OPSC. Um, I, can, I can find those out. Okay, yeah, it would be great um, 
to maybe have a down the line a further report on that just to see how much money we've applied for can we apply for any more and when the money comes back in can we then use that money for further projects yeah and typically just for the board's information OPSC dollars typically when you get them back they have to be spent if if we actually spent the money first if they're reimbursed they're typically used in like of what the original dollars were used so if we used general unrestricted on a project you can take OPSC back and use it on general unrestricted if we use measure L you have to then really use the dollars more on construction or upgrade so that's that's the way if we see any OPSC dollars most likely they would come back and go back into um, facilities okay because I know we still have a tremendous amount of facility need absolutely um, so anyway thanks for the presentation and I'm glad there was just that small finding that's one of the first findings ever I think in the 12 years we've been getting these reports right yeah we yeah you know we do our best trustee Dashi just a quick question you said that Erlindo could go to sites and kind of explain the process again to spend the money? Um, so for school site council, I'm happy to do it. I'm, okay, we can, okay. Yeah, but um, Herlinda went to Aptos Junior specifically to kind of explain to them what the options were in terms okay. of dollar amount. What could I spend that on? But yeah, we're always happy to go work okay. with the principal. Because, you know, I know the principal at Radcliffe is kind of new. She's been there mm -hmm. for like a year or two. And I, I always, you know, try to, to talk with like, hey, you know, you have, you know, this money for infrastructure, you know, you guys should get together. And But I, I think maybe if I could connect with you too, maybe you could kind of get it going. So I just Yeah, absolutely. And we can also pull the original Measure L, kind of the yeah. projects that were designed for Radcliffe and kind of look at are there any of these projects that you still want to pursue. Uh, yeah, well, so yeah, uh, just to see the school site council, but that'd, yeah, that'd be absolutely. great. So, thank you. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second? No second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries seven zero. Thanks, Dylan. I got pulled. Oh. And uh, just one more comment. Thank you very much to the Bond Oversight Committee, who's been um, essentially overseeing this bond for the last 12 years. In particular, we've got two former board members on that committee, and um, Bill Beecher, who I think has been there from the very beginning. And thank you to Mr. Reed for coming tonight and for serving on the committee. These are all volunteers. Thank you. All right, moving on to 9.7, Resolution 232405. Oh, thank you. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just trying to move this along. All right. Um, good. It's a minor one, right? All right. 9.6, 2022-23 uh, unaudited actuals. Uh, Clint and um, it's our CBO and Jenny M, our Director of um, Fiscal Services. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. Um, yes, we have for you today the 22-23 unaudited actuals report. Um, oddly enough, I don't actually, I'm not going to present it. Jenny has worked tirelessly over the past few weeks, working late nights and weekends, so this is a lot of her energy and effort, so she actually wanted to present and talk about it. So I'm gonna step aside and allow her to do that. Thank you, and I think um, you and Rich will be able to trade positions right now. You can sit pretty, so. <laughs> Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, uh, Superintendent Shuckman. My name is Jenny M. I'm the Director of Fiscal Services, and I'm here to present our 22-23 unaudited actuals report. So first I wanted to give a quick overview of what our fiscal timeline looks like. So if we go back to June, um, we brought our 22-23 estimated actuals to board. Um, it's called estimated actuals because at that time we're still working with a projected budget. At the same time, we brought the 23-24 adopted budget. So now we're in September, we're bringing the unaudited actuals to you for review and approval. It's called unaudited because we've closed the books, made our closing entries before our independent auditors um, are on site to review. Um, next up in December, we'll be bringing our first interim to you. That includes um, updated planning projections um, and planning factors from July 1st to October 31st. So at that point, we will see some of the impacts of the decline in enrollment that we're seeing in the current school year. 
Um, in March, we'll have the second interim budget update. And then in June, it starts all over again. We'll bring the estimated actuals and then the 24-25 budget. So this is just another visual representation of what the budget cycle looks like and the cyclical nature. So I just wanted to go over the purpose of the unaudited actuals report. It's to show the year-end uh, summary of our actual revenue expenditures and our ending balances as well as our reserves. So after the board reviews and approves, it goes to the County Office of Education where they also do their review certified to the California Department of Education. Um, independently of that, we have our auditors come on site. They'll be back on site in the fall to do their review and they submit to the state controller. So I wanted to just do a quick overview of where we landed on the unrestricted side of the general fund. So here we see in the very um, left-hand column where we were at estimated actuals. And then we have where we landed with unaudited actuals. We have the change in dollars and then we also have the percent change. Up top we show revenues and we see for total revenues we had less than a 1% change. Uh, most of that was due to additional um, property taxes that came in in the final county treasury J29 that we trued up at year end. We also had additional unrestricted lottery revenues that came in for uh, fourth quarter that we booked. Um, that GASB entry that we're seeing, that is a brand new entry that we are required by our auditors in the county office to book um, going forward. So what that is, the fair market value calculation, that is the difference between the pooled investments of all of the school districts um, held at the county treasury and the bank versus the change in um, investment value because of uh, changes in the stock market. So this year for 22-23, the estimate was um, a de decrease of 3.7%. It's basically a conversion entry, so we book it and then we reverse it right in 23-24. So it's not impacting our actual cash. Moving down to expenditures and unrestricted, um, we're seeing less than a 1% change from estimated actuals for total salaries and benefits, as well as for books and supplies. Um, where we are seeing a little bit of a variance is for services and other operating expenditures. We're seeing a negative 6.78% um, decrease. That is um, mainly due to a big chunk of that 350,000 is because our legal and insurance costs came in lower than projected at estimated actuals. So some of that is due to just current administration um, needing legal services a little bit less um, than in, in the past years. Um, additionally, that includes um, unspent site discretionary allocations as well as departmental allocations, and then just a year and true up of any open requisitions um, that were still encumbering funds. Um, so if we go all the way down to the bottom, we can see the net impact to the ending balance and unrestricted. So we're seeing that there was a, an increase of about 2.7 million, which equates to about 5.81%. Most of that is due to the increase in revenue that we saw, as well as a decrease in the unrestricted contribution made to the restricted side, which is mostly for special education. Um, on the bottom, that audit adjustment, that is to establish the 21-22 starting balances for that fair market value previously it was recorded in the audit report as a conversion entry. Starting this year, it's going to be recorded in our governmental funds as part of closing. So I wanted to drill a little bit more into what makes up our ending fund balance. Um, what are the legal requirements that we have to have as a school district? So if we look um, on line two, the ending balance, we're landing at around just under 49 million on the unrestricted side. So right off the top of that 49 million, um, we have to maintain a 3% reserve for economic uncertainty. For us this year, that's 3% of our total expenditures plus any transfers out. So that comes out to a little over $10 million. The important thing about this is we can never use, utilize these funds if we want to maintain a positive certification. So part of what the county office and what the state um, look at when they do their review is to make sure that we are able to maintain fiscal solvency in not only the current year, but two years out. That's the requirement, three years. So by maintaining the minimum reserve, that's an indicator to 
the state and to the COE that we are not going to be experiencing fiscal distress. If our multi-year projections at any point show that in the current year or two years out, we can no longer maintain our minimum requirement, um, depending on the severity and how many years that's impacting, um, that indicates not only fiscal distress, but that we are on our way to fiscal insolvency. So that means an automatic um, qualified or negative certification. So that's just the importance of that REO. In the blue up top, that's 6.8 million. That is an additional 3% reserve that was committed by the board back in 1617. It stays at that 1617 level going forward, and it stays in our um, unrestricted fund balance. Um, and we can kind of think of it as if 48 million is our total unrestricted fund balance, so 6.8 of it, we're just setting aside in its own bucket for emergencies. In the green, we have um, the 5.8. That is tied to the board-approved MOU for the four extra teacher days in 23-24 through 24-25. This amount is also set aside because it's essentially been promised through a resolution. And then the, in the orange, um, the 4.6 million, that is tied to the additional 15% concentration grants that we received in 21-22. Because of the timing of when we received these funds from the state, we weren't able to utilize those in that year. So by law, we have to um, set that aside because we can only use it for certain positions. So we have now, um, for unassigned, um, just under 21 million. And I heard um, the comments um, from the public and you know, when we look at that number, just as individuals, our gut reaction is that that is a large number. But what I implore you is to look at our budget um, and look at the scope and scale of our total budget. So in our general fund for 22-23, if you look at our unrestricted plus our restricted expenditures, that kind of came out to just over $329 million. If we look at it in a monthly breakdown for 23-24, for example, our monthly payroll costs alone or $24 million. That's just salaries and benefits that we're paying out. And if we're considering all of the other operational costs associated with keeping the lights on, making sure we're providing services um, for our students, paying our staff, that comes out to roughly around $30 million a month, depending on the month. Um, so when we look at the fund balance, we need to make sure that we are able to meet our fiscal responsibilities, not only in the current year, but like I said, in the subsequent two years. And that's kind of the gift of the multi-year projection that we see at the interim and the adopted budget periods. It lets us look forward two years, even though it doesn't come to fruition maybe 100% because planning factors are always changing, it gives us that time to make those thoughtful decisions beforehand. So we can make the decisions now to maintain uh, fiscal solvency in the future. Um, we had mentioned earlier the possibility or interest in maybe another bond. Maintaining um, good reserves and having a positive certification is very important to maintaining a high uh, bond rating as well. So now I'm going to head over to the restricted side. Um, again, we're going to go over the revenues first. So in federal revenues, that 10% um, variance, that's tied to restricted grants that are subject to unearned revenue rules. So if you recall from our budget study session, these are grants where we can't recognize revenues received until there's a corresponding and qu uh, qualifying expenditure. So what we did was any services that we couldn't meet this year, we've moved it over to 2324 for both revenue and expenditure. Um, where we're seeing the largest increase is in other state um, we're seeing an increase of 25 million. Those are mainly tied to two new block grants that we received since estimated actuals. Um, we couldn't book it at that time because the state did not uh, release the resource code, so it wasn't even available in the reporting software. Going down to um, expenditures, we can see uh, salaries and benefits came in right around 1%, mostly tied to EWRs. Um, books and supplies, that's mainly tied to the science, twig, textbook, and curriculum adoption. It's really the difference between receiving the delivery on June 30th or July 1st. So if we received it June 30th, we could have booked it as a 22-23 expense, but we didn't. So we're going to move it over to 23-24. 
Um, so services, that's tied to the um, federal revenues and moving it over to 23-24. So we can kind of see down at the very bottom, the net impact to the restricted ending balance was um, about 30 million increase from estimated actuals, again, tied to those block grants. And I'll be speaking to that more in the next slide. So here we have um, a high level summary of some of our largest one-time uh, grants that are still remaining. The ones highlighted in yellow are subject to earned revenue. So those uh, revenues that we received, they have not been recognized in our 22-23 unaudited actuals. We will see that reflected in 23-24. So the other remaining block grants, what I want to kind of talk about is because these are one-time grants that we received either the full amount or most of the amount up front, we are reflecting in a restricted fund balance um, the funds meant for an earmarked for multiple years. So we can see for the block grants, they're tied to either four or five uh, year strategic plans that have either gone to board and been approved um, or been approved by administration. So we can see you know, just with these block grants here, um, if we look at the total restricted um, ending balance, um, about 40 million of it is tied to one-time block grants. Um, about 11 million of it is uh, tied to ELOP, um, 2.5 to the Literacy Coaches and Reading Specialist Grant, 2 million to Restricted Lottery, and 2.5 to Food Nutrition Related Grants. Um, this uh, report is an action item, so it's respectfully requested that the board approve the 22-23 unaudited actuals. Um, next steps will be bringing first interim to board um, in December, and the auditors will be here um, in the fall to conduct their audit. Um, and one thing I just wanted to quickly touch on um, is when we look at the adopted budget multi-year projection, I'm sure we remember in the out years in 24, 25, and 25, 26, and, and the unrestricted side because of declining enrollment, um, that we are starting to deficit spend. So at adopted budget, we were projecting to deficit spend um, about 3.6 million in unrestricted, and in 25, 26, about 7.2 million. Um, and this is factoring in a higher enrollment projection for 23, 24. So I just wanted to kind of touch base on that. Um, that the reason we have those reserves, again, I know it's one of the most challenging things, it's to balance the needs of our students in the current year, but also maintaining um, fiscal solvency um, in the, in the multi-year projection as well. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to our fiscal team. Um, we should be proud of the dedicated and hardworking staff we have um, who closed the books for 22-23 and finance, accounting, and payroll and benefits. And I wanted to open up for any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Nellie and Roddy. <laughs> Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Shackman, somewhere. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you, Jenny M, for that presentation and all the work of the uh, finance department in putting that together. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is the ending fund balance, something I've talked to you about um, quite a bit in the past. So what has been highlighted in um, the slides that have been presented to you um, and, and explained a little bit more in detail, right, are things like the restricted ending fund balance. So in the, one of the slides, it was about 59.8 million. Um, and then the explanation of attached to that dollar amount, right, um, are funds being tied to specific things like a grant um, or a categorical program or supplemental COVID funding, one-time monies, et cetera. Um, what was not highlighted, though, in that presentation is the total ending fund balance. So if you look at line two on page 13 of the SACS binder, the total ending fund balance for the 22-23 unaudited actuals, um, that is both unrestricted and restricted, is $108.6 million. $108.6 million. 
Um, what I do in my current role is I negotiate for the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, I felt like we did a really excellent job working with the district in this last round, both on contract language as well as on a on salary raise for our membership. Um, that was for the 22-23 and 23-24 school years, but we are gonna go into reopeners for the 24-25 school year. And I know I've stood up here and I've said it a, a number of times, money is not everything, but it is important. And I hope that you are thinking about that number and remembering, as people have already mentioned, people are still leaving this profession. Teachers have still left in this school year. So remember that number and remember where that money needs to go and that's to our students and those who serve them. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks for your thorough presentation. Actually, it was the first time actually that I enjoyed listening to um, a, um, a budget report. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, yeah, we look at numbers um, and we do it because we hear and we see the realities, you know, in, in our school sites and amongst our the people that we represent where some teachers are unhoused. Um, and so we do worry about that and we think about also um, our members who are faced with major medical issues. So those, those it's important health benefits and the salary that we earn um, as educators in this area. So one of the things that we have under our unrestricted um, portion of our ending reserve is that additional 3% that I think was like voted on, I don't know, like in 2019 or something, like, no, not in 2017, I don't know, many years ago now. But that was something that you all have the ability to change. Um, so essentially, if you're just looking at the unrestricted ending reserve, um, taking that 3%, it's that 3% that keeps you solvent and that keeps you in good standing. Um, but you, the district is still 20, and so I took out, if you take out our, our optional days and the um, coach um, monies that were on there, and I'm ignoring that additional 6 million 3% because that actually can change, um, it, the district still has close to 28 million over of, in, their, in that reserve, um, un, in the unrestricted, and, and so it's, it's, and it's, I don't know if it's something new this year where they're taking better account of the restricted funds because last year the ending reserve for the restricted funds was like 16 million, but now it's close to 60. Uh, so those are things that we look at and we have questions. Um, but I hope that as we move forward in this reopener year that you all continue to take into account that the employees in this district um, their livelihoods matter. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Scow. Sure, first question. Um, on the numbers for the reserves, are these any different than what was presented at the last meeting or are they the same? Because we, didn't we just certify the reserves at the last meeting? Uh, so those were tied to the adopted budget. So if we look at, um, let me go back. So if we look on the unrestricted, just because I have a, a screenshot of that from Form 01 in the SACS binder. So on the, um, uh, sorry, that's unadopted. I don't think I have a screenshot, I'm sorry. If you look in your SACS binder in Form 01 um, for adopted budget, so what was presented in the reserves matches what was presented for adopted budget, and it's it's also reflected um, in the SACS um, binder. So. When we go into first interim, um, at that point, um, you know, administration and cabinet will be working um, together to kind of figure out if there needs to be any shifts that have to be made. Okay. Um, next question is about um, using funds, moving funds. I think you said something about putting some of the ESSER funds in 
the restricted? Did you say something like that in the in the balance? Oh, let me go back. So uh, the ESSER funds are always in the restricted um, side of mm -hmm. the general fund. Um, but what happens is because the ESSER funds, they're federal funds, so they're, um, they are subject to unearned revenue rules. So if we receive revenue that we don't have a qualifying and um, allowable expenditure to offset, we can't recognize that revenue. Um, so we basically have to book it as a liability, which is unearned revenue. So for the ESSER funds here, we can see there was about um, 10.3 billion that we had actually received cash for, but we don't have a qualifying expenditure to match. So we're going to move that over to 23, 24. And most of that is just tied to capital facility projects that weren't completed in 22, 23. So how much flexibility do we have in moving money between restricted and non-restricted? Does it depend on the specific funding source every time? There's zero flexibility. So when we get, so when the reason why in the general fund we have unrestricted and restricted separated is because the restricted funds are generally grants um, that are tied to specific purposes. So one of the conditions of applying and receiving a grant is us basically promising that we are going to utilize it for those specified um, intents. So if so there is absolutely no way that we can move restricted over to unrestricted without it being a major audit finding and how much of the uh, money i mean is there any correlation between restricted the grant money is there a general pattern with that money and money we're using during the school day or an after school is it mostly after school so actually um most of the restricted funds um they're tied to what's happening in the school. So I kind of want to highlight here, and I'm really, really excited because I think the district and with the board, um, we did a great job of coming up with these strategic plans. So we can see with the arts, music, and instructional materials block grant. So that was brought to board um, back in December. I'm sorry, that's a typo. It should be December 7, 2022. Um, to approve for use through 25-26. Um, I have a copy of that plan. Um, so we're utilizing those funds for um, textbook adoptions, for world languages, middle school mathematics, um, science, high school English, to purchase new instruments, um, development of a marching band at the comprehensive high schools, new uniforms, transportation, um, where we created individual purchase orders per teacher so they can um, order supplies. Um, updating library collections, expanding Save the Music. So um, so that's just an example of one of the plans. So these funds, even though they're sitting and are restricted, it's meant to be used over multiple years based on a plan that's been built and brought to board. So um, I think that's one thing I really want to highlight is um, these funds are going towards our students. Um, they are being used, I think, I believe in an appropriate manner. Um, but right now, because we received the funds up front, they're basically inflating our restricted fund balance in the moment, but they are meant to be used up over time. Right, mm -hmm. we're doing multi-year budgeting. Mul so sometimes we mm -hmm. hear well, we're in deficit spending, but we were planning for that, and we're not actually building a deficit. In fact, the reserve is two million higher, as you just And I think that's out. kind of where we have to differentiate restricted versus unrestricted. So on the restricted side with these multi-year block grants, that is built into the budget. On the, res on the unrestricted side, when we talk about the deficit spending, that's where we don't have a multi-year plan. So as we see the historically declining enrollment, as we see costs of um, employees start to rise, we're starting to see that on the unrestricted side. So overall, I just want to say, um, if I had your job and your positions and you were presenting to the board and with the fact that the reserves are bigger than initially projected, I think that's a great thing. Like your jobs are to make sure we have money and that is very important. Our job is to make sure we're spending money wisely and that we're spending enough money. And we're gonna have, a, oh, those are who are tracking the arts item, the arts teacher item saga that will never end. Hopefully that'll be resolved at the next meeting and we can talk about ensuring we're spending money. Obviously not to put the district in financial jeopardy. I don't think anybody wants to do that. And there's a lot of room for negotiation and, and reasonable minds can disagree. So overall, I just wanna say thank you. We have a lot of money. We have a lot of needs. We're a big district. And I wanna turn it back over to my colleagues. All right, any other board comments? I know as 
you know, in my own role of um, you know, managing, you know, grants that are smaller in, in scope than what our district is dealing, but just, you know, it's like I manage a couple of grants on the order of a, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars and just the challenges of, you know, conversations with people about, yeah, but we have all this money, we should do this. It's like, but this is what I can do with it. Um, and it's challenging. It's really, it's, it's an incredibly challenging conversation to have. I really appreciate the way that you've clearly outlined you know, some of this information. I think that really helps, especially for our members of the public who don't necessarily follow every board meeting. Um, but I think this is an important topic, and I, I think it was very clearly laid out, and so thank you for, for your work on that. Thank you. Vice President Acosta? I, I do have a comment. Um, really just much more of a comment I, that I wanted to um, acknowledge our Director of Physical Services, Jenny M, on her <laughs> fabulous first presentation to our board, and congratulate her. Thank you, you. did a very good <laughs> job. Thank you. I'd watch out for her, Clint. She got a run on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Clint, Clint has been amazing, and I just want to thank um, all of his hard work and his support, and thank you to the board. That was a great presentation, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One of the most clear I think we've had in a long time, so thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. I'll second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And now we're moving on to 9.7. Resolution 23-24-05, our GAN limit. Jenny, please Thank continue. you. Um, so this one will be a pretty quick one. Um, Uh, so this is resolution 23-2405 um, to set our GAN limit. Um, so just to kind of go into what the GAN limit is, it originates back in 1979, and the intent was to make sure that government spending did not grow faster than the growth in population and inflation. So the GAN limit does not impact um, school district spending in any way, but what it does is it informs um, the state on if they need to change um, the state appropriations limit for the next year. So the GAN form is part of the SACS binder at on audited actuals. And what our calculation shows this year is that there is no increase to the GAN appropriations limit coming from our school district. So um, I respectfully request the approval of resolution 23-2405 um, for our GAN limit this year. Any questions? I'm just double checking that we don't have any mm -hmm. public speakers. Uh, President Holm had to step out for a second. She will be right back. Um, so we have no public speakers, so we'll bring it back to the board. Does the board have any questions and or comments? I, I have no question. Would like to make a motion to approve the GAN limit. Okay, I have it's a presented. I have a motion to approve. I'll second. And I have a second. And all those in favor, please say. Aye. 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 Thank, thank um, you so much. And that vote will carry one, two, three, four, five, five, um, five zero two. Thank you. thank you, Jenny, again. Okay, and then moving on to action item 9.8, approval of job description for Director of Migrant Education, and this uh, report will be... Oh, there she is, by Lisa <laughs> Carey, Assistant <laughs> Superintendent of Secondary Education. Good evening once again. Um, I'm here this, uh, now to present on the job description for the Director of Migrant Education. The August 23rd board meeting, I brought um, forward the uh, draft to see if there were any comments, questions, or revisions. And so this evening, I just bring forward the same exact um, proposal for the uh, language of the Director of Migrant Education for this evening for your approval. Sorry, wonderful, thank you, Lee, um, Superintendent Aguirre. And we do not have any public comment on this, so I will bring it back to the board for comments, discussion. Yes, Trustee Dodge, Jr. Thank you very much, 
Trustee Acosta. So currently, it, it's Luis Medina? That is correct. Uh, how long is this contract, or how long is he going to be in this position? For? This is not a contract. This is just the job descriptions to entail his, his, duly, his duties on a daily job. Mm -hmm. So this has nothing to do with his direct employment. Um, he is a management position, um, which is not on a contract basis. Oh, okay. Well, I just, but th this is for his position, correct? It is for his position. So the previous one, I believe it was 1979, it was first created and then updated in 1984. The last time that the, um, the state migrant came out and then also through um, different, um, uh, the the FPM, um, it was asked that the job description was updated because it had not been updated in a long time. Mm -hmm. So this is um, updated to reflect the director of migrant, migrant education at different um, districts throughout the state. Okay. Um, I had a bunch of questions for him, but I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Luis Medina. I, I know he's from Watsonville and he's gone to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and he's uh, a wildcat as me as well. So I just want to say thank you, Luis, for all the years that he's dedicated um, to our district, not just as the director of migrant ed, but as a teacher, um, guidance counselor, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Luis. He's amazing. He's at home listening. He's ill this evening, so. Right. Thank you. And if my colleagues don't have anything to add, I would like to make a motion to support this agenda item. Great. And I'll second that, and President Holmes back. I'll turn it back over to her. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Scott? I just had a question about the salary range. Is that, is there a, a room to go up or is that, what does that mean? Are it's the same that? exact salary schedule that was um, before. So this salary schedule does not change with the job description. So it's the one that was previously approved by the board. And he's a direct, it's a director level position. Yes, it is. And, that, and it's a combination of that level and how many years they've been in the position, their salary range. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all good. Any further comments? Trustee DeSerpa? Just um, with appreciation to Mr. Medina. He's great. So we have a first and a second, I think. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll echo my colleagues' uh, statements of appreciation because he's done a, a remarkable job. And if, if there are no further comments, we do have a first and a second. And I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries 7 0. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.9, .9, approved job description and certificated management 2023-2024 salary schedule. Our um, coordinator, child welfare and attendance report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, our assistant superintendent of human resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, board of trustees, superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. Um, so before you tonight, I have a job description and a salary schedule um, with the addition of this position. So the, the district received about a $2 million grant for the learning communities for school success. Um, the purpose of that grant is to target our um, most vulnerable students who are having challenges with attendance, um, behavior, social emotional learning, and there's also some pieces for parent engagement. This position would be focusing on, it's about 33% of our population that are, are chronically truant. Um, and so this position would be putting in systems that we can maintain um, after the grant is over that addressing the needs of our, like I said, our most vulnerable, basically our tier three intervention of our students who are having um, significant attendance. This position will live under student services, so it's in alignment with the coordinator already of student services, so it would be reporting to the director of student services. Um, also outlined in the grant is the addition of a mental health clinician as well to work at supporting and providing serv services to these students. So. There's the job description for the position and the salary schedule um, reflects the placement at I think, range 39 with, for 222 days. So I respectfully request that you approve the job description and the salary schedule. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yeah. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. So we're creating this position for two years, correct? Three. Three. Yes. Uh, do we already have someone in mind who's going to do this position or? No, no, we're going to run a fair and impartial process. So, you know, some concerns that I've heard from my constituents, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully this person can be bilingual. Uh, hope, you know, hopefully this person is working with the families and the students mm -hmm. and not just directly here from the towers. And if, if they are working from the towers, do we plan to 
hire any analysts that are going to actually work for the families? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So, I mean, their home base will be the district office, but we have two um, attendants. Um, I don't know if they're analysts, but they're specialists that are designed directly to do home visits. So this person would be overseeing those two employees that we have already to get out and do more of that tier three intervention and getting out to the families and the homes and, and, and working in the community that way. So that is the intention behind part of this position. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Right. Trustee De Serpa? The perfect person for a position like this is a social worker with a master's degree who understands how to work with families and what the resources are. So I, I see that you have to have a counseling degree or, or be some type of right, mental health professional. Some, yeah, the equivalent, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make a motion to approve. Trustee Scow? I just have a question. Who will this person report to? The Director of Student Services. Ivana Karas. A second. All right, I have a first and a second. If there's no further discussion, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um, moving on to item 9.10 approval of ethnic studies consultant contract. The report will be presented by Claudia Manjadas, Director of ELA History and Ethnic Studies. There, now it's on. Hi, good evening. Um, before I start, I do want to hand out a copy of some stuff to you guys because at one point it's going to be really small on there and I want you to be able to read it. So. Okay, so good evening. Um, President Dr. Holm, Board of Trustees, Interim Superintendent Mr. Sheckman. Um, and I'm here to bring forward the contract with um, Community Responsive Education. I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. This is a common practice within Ethnic Studies classrooms. Um, and it's meant to acknowledge the land we live, teach, and learn upon while addressing the, the inhabitants who have been there prior to colonization. So, um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am a settler on the land that I reside upon and the land that I teach on. This land has been the home to Amamutsan people and they are still here. All right, so moving forward, um, I'd like to talk a little bit, or start by talking a little bit about where we began with our ethnic studies work. Um, it came out of the secondary equity audit where our starting point was looking at graduation rates, DNF rates, and attendance rates. And looking at those pieces, that's where we decided to start to build our first ethnic studies courses through our English departments. And getting started at the time, because we're looking at about five years ago, six years ago, when we started, we reached out to Christine Sleater um, and met with her. She recommended the reading, uh, Rethinking Ethnic Studies book. So that is one of the books that we started with when we were looking at um, initial resources around pedagogy which, lo and behold, later for us, it came to be a good thing because it's actually referenced four times in, our, um, in the CDE model curriculum, Ethnic Studies model curriculum, as a resource. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more where that comes in. Uh, we were also looking at what was available on the CDE website at the time. Uh, this was before even the 2019 draft was created. Um, but then once the 2021 draft came out, we did start to look at that. Um, the CDE provided uh, training, like a train the trainer certificate, which I participated in, so I have that, that certification. Um, and then we were also looking at UCSC courses that were already in the portal. Um, we started that at the very beginning, and we continue to do that anytime we build a new course, because um, as the model curriculum dictates in AB 101, it, we should be looking at courses that are UC or CSU approved as guidance. So that's one of the things that we look at. Um, eventually, we started reaching out more towards community resources. So in other words, um, Watsonville's in the Heart is one of the organizations that we've been working with the last couple of years, at the very least. And then um, there was at one of our prior meetings, it was recommendation to start reaching out to UCSC. So we have been in touch with um, UCSC's history department, working with Catherine, Kathleen Gutierrez, um, and 
um, with support on that. And then the last two years, we were working with community responsive education. So, how, whoops, there we go. So through this work for the last several years, um, I wanna kind of explain a little bit about what are the pieces that we've been doing internally and what are the pieces that are being supported by um, the community and the consultant. So when it comes to training, the outside consultant is the one that's helping us around the pedagogy piece, piece which is essentially the how of the teaching. That's the, the theory and in practice. The lesson planning piece is actually done internally within our district. So what that means is, over the last couple of years working with CRE, um, they've helped us create our vision, our values, um, start to begin to build out our framework, our ethnic studies PVSD framework. Um, their work with teachers over the last couple of years has consisted of developing a teaching philosophy. Um, each teacher was supposed to look at what their purpose and intentions were for creating a better world. They needed to consider how to be community and culturally responsive. And they looked, through, looked at it through a lens of heart, head, and hands, meaning that heart was their vision and purpose. Hands was their action, so what, what is their responsibility and how do you foster those relationships, self-determination, community, hope, love, and respect within your classroom. And then the head piece is the commitments, which is essentially the same thing as a mission statement, like a teacher mission statement. Uh, one of the other things that they worked on was a critical eth autoethnography. Um, that's where they look at analyzing their own story to understand um, their own life and how that connects more deeply with the stories of others, basically focusing on humanizing the most vulnerable communities that we work with. We then ended up moving into year two, so did some more deeper work with uh, culturally responsive education and um, activities in the classroom. We got support with building out our scope and sequences. And again, that does not mean this particular lessons, that means building out our scope and sequence. So if the packet that I shared with you, if you flip past the first page, it actually will line out um, our overviews for the current courses that we have. Um, the scope and sequence is a little bit different than that in that it takes you across each year um, by quarter and we'll list out essential questions and um, pieces like that. Um, we also worked with them and got support on how to build community in the classroom. And then, um, like I said before, then we, uh, part of the work was around um, guidance on, okay, so what are you going to do? Who are you going to reach out to to help build um, bonds in the community? All right, so where does that lead us now in our ethnic studies development? So the handout that I gave you, it does have our vision. Again, I know it's a little heavy on the screen, but I wanted you to have a copy of it so you could see it. It is at the top of that first page document. Um, and our vision is um, to provide rich learning experiences that center experiences, stories, and knowledge of ethnic studies groups, while also shaping a lens to understand and critique dominant power structures ultimately to eliminate racism and intersectional forms of oppression. Ethnic studies will provide a culturally and community responsive education that values the fields in and of Pajaro Valley. So the fields is one of the big things that we've received support around building. Um, that is on that same page. So if you look down on that table, the fields stand for freedom, identity, empathy, literacy, dreams, and solidarity. So those are our guiding values. Um, on the document that you have, it does show what the teacher commitments are in response to each of those. So you can see those are those agreements that we are um, working off of. These are our current courses and the pathways that students can take ethnic studies within our district. Anything in green means that they do not need a prerequisite. They can enter that. So those are all the entry points to be able to satisfy their ethnic studies graduation requirement. And then the ones that are in white, they do require um, a uh, prerequisite. So um, right now, you can see that there are three um, Ethnic Lit and Studies courses. Those are through English. And the Ethnic Lit 2 and Ethnic Lit 3 are both honors courses. They were UC approved to, for honors designation. 
Um, we have world history and U.S. history. This is the first year with U.S. history. And then um, we do have, this is we're going into our third year with Art One. So one of our goals for this year is to identify another VAPA area to create out, create out another ethnic studies course. Um, we have some teachers at PV High who are, one in particular, who's very eager to get started and um, work with us on that. So we're hoping to be able to submit um, probably a dance class or something along those lines um, in December or February, whenever it opens into the portal, the UC portal, because all of these are UC approved. Um, on these next slides, it just kind of shows you where we are in terms of how many teachers we have at each of the sites and um, number of sections, which grades are getting uh, served for um, access to these courses. Um, so this one's Watsonville High, bless you. Uh, this is Watsonville High. We have a to team there of uh, seven teachers across the three content areas, three departments. At PV High, we have a total of four teachers um, this year, which is a nice bump from last year. And um, at, this, at Watsonville and at PV, we do offer ELS 1, 2, and 3. Um, Aptos High, we have ELS 1 and 2. Um, we have World and US, and then we also have Arts. We have a team of five teachers there. Um, common questions that come up are what's the difference between that traditional English course and our PVSD literature and lit, lit and studies courses. Traditional English class, um, if, you were in, if you remember back to school, I know it was a while ago, um, is that me? Okay, I'll go really quick. So this is the story plot. Um, you can see the rise in action. We combine that with the problem solving practice, which then takes us into a uh, ethnic studies praxis story plot. So it's very similar, but we are looking at it through an ethnic studies lens with the f uh, foundations of ethnic studies. Um, let me jump ahead on this one. Okay, and then we do have, just for your access, we have compelling questions in English. So you can kind of see out, um, how those build across the three. And then we have um, history, traditional in history classes versus ethnic studies ones. The ethnic studies ones focus on more, one, more than one uh, perspective or experience in history. Um, this is another big thing we try and make sure all of our teachers understand the difference between equality, equity, and justice. And um, these are our compelling questions for history, essentially the essential questions. Okay, all right. And then these were just pieces I wanted to put in because I know these had come up before in prior conversations around um, ethnic studies. Okay, I'll stop since my bell went off. <laughs> any, any, I'm done. All right. Yeah. Do we have any public speakers to decide? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Sorry, we have two: Gil Stein and Ra Shorenstein. Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Checkman, trustees, and staff. I am Roz Shorenstein, co-chair of the Jewish Community Education Forum. I had the privilege of meeting with Claudia, Hillary, and Ingrid, and I think Pajaro Valley is very lucky to have such a dedicated, capable, and certified staff to implement ethnic studies. However, I oppose renewing the contract with Community Responsive Education. Why? Alison Tatango Cabales is the co-founder and principal consultant of CRE. Just a few days ago, she signed a letter to Governor Newsom and Superintendent Thurmond, accusing them of attacks on liberatory ethnic studies. Their offense, Thurmond had chaired a timely education to end hate, countering anti-Semitism anti webinar on August 23rd. Tatango Cabales objected to stopping hate as a goal of education. The governor's educational policy advisor, Brooks Allen, had sent a letter to school leaders asking them not to promote any bias, bigotry, or discrimination against any person or group protected by Education Code Section 220, an important guardrail highlighted when AB 101 was signed. Tatiango Kubalis's letter dismisses Allen's instructions as being, quote, without merit or need. 
The California Department of Education, as Claudia had mentioned, offers model curriculum train the teachers certification webinars. Titiango Cabala's letter dismisses this project as well, saying, quote, the certificate doesn't represent any level of competence. I would hope that the people who had received the certificate would disagree with that. The questions that this board needs to ask are, why are Titiango Cabalas and her ideological colleagues picking a fight with the governor, his educational policy person, the superintendent of California schools, the Jewish Legislative Caucus, and the Department of Education? Why is their agenda so divisive and controversial? Why are they resisting compliance with California law and California education law? Why invest $110,000 in CRE now? I'm sure the district could use those funds better in, in, in other ways. And I think that the very resourceful staff could find much less expensive, if not free, sources for teacher training and administrative support. I urge the board not to renew the CRE contract. Thank you for your consideration. My, excuse me, my name is Gil Stein and I've lived in the PVUSD uh, area for close to 40 years now. And I'm here because I'm concerned that despite the warnings from the governor, the state legislature, the State Department of Education, and others, you're still being asked to approve a contract with CRE. Back in 2019, the State Department of Education asked educators to come up with a program for ethnic studies, a curriculum. It was done, and your proposed uh, consultant was, one that was the co-chair. That curriculum was rejected by the governor and the Department of Education for being biased and bigoted. So they started over again and they came up with a new curriculum which is now in place. Those people, including your proposed uh, consultant, disavowed any connection with that new model. So what's happening now is that you're being asked to have a consultant who created a rejected policy for bigotry. It was rejected for bigotry. Is she going to teach that or is she going to teach the curriculum that she has, this of, that she doesn't want anything to do with? There's something wrong with that. They're asking you to pay $110,000 for this when the state offers this for free. Last month, the governor's office notified various school districts that some vendors are trying to circumvent the legislative intent of AB 101. In response to that comment, your proposed consultant essentially acknowledged that's exactly what we're trying to do. CRE opposes the legislative intent of AB 101, the guidelines of the Department of Education, and the governor. They cannot be trusted with the education of our children, and I urge you, do not adopt this contract. It costs too much, it's not worth it, and our kids can deserve a lot more. Thank you. We have any discussion from the board? Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you to the presenters speaking. Uh, after hearing, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Um, is this a consulting firm from somewhere else or is this a group of teachers from the PVOSD? This group, the Community Responsive Education is a group of um, professors and people who have degrees in ethnic studies um, who are consulted out to school districts. Allison is one of the co-founders of that group, but no, they're not PVSD teachers. Oh, okay. And, and where are they based out of? San Francisco. And the, there is a cost to this? Yes, there is a cost. And this year is the year where we're kind of focusing in on that transition piece um, where we wanted to be able to, where is that? This is our transition year. So this would be the transition year in terms of having her team work with our administrators and building out their leadership philosophy and wellness plans for their sites. That's the next, that was gonna be the next level of work um, with them. But 
it, it's, it is possible to go towards a different direction and get this for free? Um, by certified ethnic studies people, like people with ethnic studies degrees, um, I don't know of that yet. All right, thank you. Yeah. Trustee De Serpa, I saw, I saw you. Um, so this group has been already in our district for two years. Mm -hmm. So the original curriculum, as I understand it, was written, and uh, Jewish groups all around California said no way, and they went to the governor because it was completely anti-Semitic. The curriculum was, well, first of all, what I want to say, even before that, is that I feel very proud of the work that we've done here in PBUSD because we were actually leaders in building an mm -hmm. ethnic curriculum, ethnic studies curriculum, even before the governor gave us a curriculum or made a model curriculum. So I feel really proud of, I always have, I felt very proud of the work because we were out front as one of the districts in the whole state that had this. Um, so I'll say that first. So the new curriculum was created that was scrubbed of all the anti-Semitic and bigoted things that were in it. Right. Allison said, forget it, I'm not gonna sign on, on my name to this because this is not. There were components of it that she, right. I mean, and I can't really speak for her. I can go off of what was in the news, but um, my understanding is there were pieces uh, philosophically that she didn't believe with. Right, so that they've already even been in our district teaching for two years with um, a pedagogy that mm -hmm. I don't know what they're teaching makes me very uncomfortable as a Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. Like I'm shocked actually, Roz and Gil brought this to my attention. I met with them, they've met with Murray. Um, it's shocking to me that we've uh, even allowed them to be in our district for two years. Our, our uh, COE is not using CRE, Scotts Valley is not using CRE, San Lorenzo Valley, Santa Cruz City Schools, nobody is using them, but we are. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna support this tonight. And I think, and I've recommended already, that we look to maybe UCSC as, as thought partners in terms of coming in and helping us with any training or technical assistance that we may need. So I'm gonna vote no on this tonight, and I urge mm -hmm. my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Trustee Scow? Um, yeah, so just a, a question about that, um, the concerns that have been raised in our ability with versus any consultant um, to uh, to determine how we want to do things where is that can you just describe how that's been working and is there any way to assuage trustee to serve these concerns or what is your perspective so um, one thing you know I can speak to how she how Allison and her team have been working with us so when she's teaching pedagogy um, we are talking about what are those fundamental pieces of ethnic studies. In other words, um, use of BIPOC authors. Um, how do you build a culturally responsive community in your classroom? Um, what are some of those bigger ethnic studies concepts that we would want to touch on with students? Um, at no point in there is she directing us on specific lessons nor group topics like ethnicity group topics that's because when you look at that model curriculum it does say that this the, the ESMC which is the ethnic studies model curriculum that is meant to be a guide it is not 100 percent like it's not it's not a curriculum that's meant to be like open up and do each one sample lesson because it does say in there that we need to um, adapt or adjust to the community that we are serving. So when we're looking at that, just like in past conversations with the board, there's been recommendations for us to be more inclusive of um, the Japanese culture. So we have reached out and included more um, lessons and structures around that. Um, we have never taught anti-Semitism in any of our classes. If you were to look through um, any of our scope and sequences, no, there's no anti-anything in any of those. It's all about teaching students about their identity, empowering them, and helping them 
recognize what's going on in our world and how do we work together in solidarity to change that. So there's never been any of that negative, um, uh, no, no, uh, we've never had any anti-anybody um, lessons. So just so I understand exactly what the consultants do, mm -hmm. they come in and they give presentations to our teachers and to our administrative team about how to implement, but that's their role? Or like, Well, it's not how to implement, uh, it's what understanding what ethnic studies is. So there's... Um, there's four, we go off of four macro themes, which actually line up pretty well with what's in um, the uh, ESMC. So um, going back to this slide, where did you go? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, I'm not gonna be able to find it. Anyways, um, I'll tell you what the four themes are <laughs> because they bring it up in, um, at the overview of the model curriculum as well. Oh my goodness. Which is, um, they address identity and um, identity, history, and movement. Um, there's history, action. So all of those basically line up with our units and they, do, they go by quarter. So like for example, all of our classes start with an identity unit. So in terms of um, her working with teachers, and I'll just use this one as an example, um, her work with teachers would be around what are some activities that you can do with students to help them um, dig into their identity. So the, um, the autoethnography is one of those activities. So she runs through that with the teachers, and that becomes something that if the teacher chooses to, they could use that in the classroom. It is one that we've used in the past, um, and we've actually connected with our art um, coach who has come in, our art Tosa, and she's come in and partnered up with, uh, with the teacher in the classroom and created those self-portraits, like the ones that you see downtown. Those are from our, our classes. Um, but it's really, it's the structure of it. It's not the language that the teacher is like, because I know that there's concerns about terms that get brought up, like for example, the word oppression is one of the concerns that comes up. It is in the ESMC as one of the things that's the, one of the fundamental pieces that needs to be addressed. Um, so when it comes to those pieces, that she's not dictating or saying, here's this lesson, do this. She's giving us ideas on activities. The teachers take it back. We have collaborative days where they come out with subs, each department, and then within those collaborative days, she's not there. Her and her team are not there. That's just us within our district. And then we create the lesson plans. We build out our units. And we look at who are the kids in the room, and we build to them. Um, another question, if I may, on the the history. The history. This is just interesting to me. The mm -hmm. your slide. It's twenty. Slide twenty. And I'm also curious about slide twenty one. And so, is this class going to be in addition to a history class, or it's going to be a combo, or is it either Which or? Uh, U.S. history with that. U.S. History and World History? Or, or excuse yeah, me. That's one, uh, sorry, I think it's slide 20. And Am I looking at the right thing? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure where I am in my questions. slide deck either, so it's fine. Okay, what is the difference between a traditional history course and a PVUSD oh. history ethnic studies course? Okay, this one. It's beautiful. Yeah, two bucks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, this is just basically when we're developing any history course. We are looking at it from a multi-perspective experience versus just the traditional um, essentially American perspective of events. So the student has a choice, will have a choice or they take both or? No, they have a choice. So if they opt into a world history ethnic studies or a US history ethnic studies, that gives them the same graduation requirement, satisfies the same graduation requirement as a, as a world history or US history. Same thing with the ethnic lit and studies ones, it replaces their traditional English class. So they don't have to take it on and top is that, of. Is that our choice? Is that a mandate from the state? I'm just curious. That's not a mandate. In the model curriculum, it does give districts an option of having ethnic studies be a standalone mm -hmm. or integrated within a content area, a department. We opted to do through a department area, a department course because of basically fitting it into a kid's schedule. 
right, if we do it on top of. And plus, once we got that first course out after that first year that we implemented the first ethnic lit class, um, the the desire by kids to go back into that class the following year was so great that that's why we ended up building out the second course so quickly. And just the last question. Uh, next slide. Uh, um, these words get thrown out. And mm -hmm. I, I'm somebody who comes from a family of academia, I'm just fascinated how words spread and people have different definitions. And I'm just, well, who makes these definitions? So and with these questions, is this something that we came up with? Is this something no. from them? Is this no? Idea? These are actually also defined um, by the CDE as well. The difference between equality, equity, and justice. So the equality is everybody gets the same thing, right? That's where the boxes are all the same. Equity meaning that kids get what they need, and then justice is all about removing the barrier so that all students can access. Okay. That's interesting. And okay. that's that ultimately ethnic studies moves towards justice. So we're helping kids understand what these three are and the progression of the three. Right? Uh -huh. Adam, can I say You're something? my time, yeah, go ahead, sir. I'll talk yeah. a lot. I'm not against ethnic studies. This is beautiful. When gen like when I'm fifty six years old, when I was in high school, our history book was nothing about except white guys and war. Mm -hmm. There was nothing about <laughs> natives. There was nothing about women and children. Really, it was so boring that especially those of us who are women had a, just a hard time even getting through it to right. pass the class. This is beautiful. I think what that my objection is is to who's teaching the doing the technical assistance and training and I would like to see it be mm -hmm. with UCSC instead, honestly. And, and I, I, I understand that. I just, I do want to give credit to Allison and her team because we wouldn't have this without their team. Because we were starting, but we were, we were kind of like this branchy mess and then her, she helped rein us in. So this is really all because of the work that we've done with her in the last two years to align all of this. So I just, I do want to make sure that I'm crediting her on that, her and her team. I want to make sure. Okay. Did I have, uh, our student trustee, did you want to have to add something? Um, I wanted to mention, as someone who is on the ethnic studies um, pathway and I've taken the first, second, and now I'm able to take the third course on my senior year, um, including the world history ethnic studies course, um, I want to speak to the importance that I think it has and how it's really had an impact on how I view the world right now. And it's it's really like amazing how a course can really just change your perspective and how you think of things and questioning what you're learning. So I just really wanted to touch on that. And yes, we really focus on identities and figuring out like who you are, where you come from, and what you're doing with that information. Overall, just working towards justice as you were mentioning, so thank you. And, you know, I'd like to, to add, you know, from the perspective of a parent, you know, as well as a, a, a board trustee, it's like, you know, I went to the um, Aptos High School back to school night last week and seeing it, um, so my son is in the ethnic literature studies class, Mr. Ford's class, mm -hmm. and one, seeing, you know, how the class was structured, you know, it was, it was great. And so like, I, I go home and I'm like, so how is it? And I have to understand, like my kid, like my kid was hit hard by like the shutdown, and has not been a particularly enthusiastic student. And he's like, "Oh yeah, we're reading the Firekeeper's Daughter, and there's this great character, and there's this grandmother character, and she does this, and and, and he, so she's a bad." Mm -hmm. <laughs> Without giving the story away, yeah. yep. You know, and watching his enthusiasm for the literature that he was reading, and you know, I mean, he's a white boy, right? And he, it's like, it's not taking from who he is, mm -hmm. and it's not taking from his background. Yep. It's, it's adding to his experience. Yep. It's giving him an opportunity to see the world, and he's thriving in it. Yeah. Which, as a parent who you know was frankly kind of going, okay, how's he, how's he going to do? Right. It's like, oh. 
I also, you know, a hesitation I have about disrupting, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel conflicted because I hear, you know, what my fellow trustee is saying, and I hear that. A hesitation I have about that is I look at history. I look at the history of the labor movement. And one of the ways that the labor movement was disrupted, you know, as it was forming, was by pitting the labor movement against the civil rights movement. By saying, it's like, by taking, you know, the, the white members of the labor movement and saying, the people of color are gonna try and take your jobs. You don't mm -hmm. wanna have, you don't wanna let them have the same rights and privileges as you do. Divide and conquer. Yeah. A great way to interrupt our progress with ethnic studies would be to pit groups that have been traditionally oppressed and have faced millennia of genocide and oppression mm -hmm. against each other. Yep. And it, it, so it's like, what's the right path? What's the ethical response? Mm -hmm. You know, when we have a program that has had beautiful results, yeah. and at the same time listening to the concerns mm -hmm. of our constituents. And, and you know, it's like, you know, I know you two have, have spoken to, you know, if we're particularly concerned about, you know, anti-Semitism, and that's a huge concern. You know, I know that, you know, you two have spoken to members of the Jewish community, and I, I believe you went to Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, we did. Yeah. So, um, can I respond to that? Yes. Um, so, I do want to make sure that I'm being really, really clear on the fact that in the work that we've done with Allison, again, I want to really repeat this, that we have not taught our students um, hate. We have not taught them anti any group. Um, like I said, we are teaching students to be empowered, um, learning, being open to other people's stories, respecting others. Um, we do talk a lot about coming from the heart with things, so, and how we approach, and really being open and listening. Um, and then, like I said, you know, it's a consultant. It's not, you know, for lack of a better term, Bible or gospel or whatever you want to call it, right? It's not law. It's a consultant. And we have not just her voice, but we do have um, UCSC's history department that we work with. We also have the Watsonville and the Hart folks. So everybody, there's, there's multiple perspectives coming in. And then our responsibility at the district level and at the teacher level is to help make sure that we are looking at it with that lens to avoid any possible um, bias or bigotry or discrimination. So those are, I mean, any way you look at any consultant that you work with, that's the responsibility of the people who contract with them. So I do want to, you know, kind of put that out there in terms of understanding how we do that. And I mean, even in the past with any other con consultant that I've worked with in other areas, it's the same thing. If something doesn't feel right, we just say, nope, we're not doing that, right? And we just, we don't do it. It doesn't work for us. So, um, and then can I also piggyback on the, the book thing? Because I, I think that's a great, thank you for bringing up that title, because when I, we talk about building these courses to the students that are in front of us, that's another thing that we do look at, because our three high school communities are very different. And so, um, when you go to each one, you're not going to see, there'll be some common text, but in our, in our ethnic lit courses, you won't see the exact same book list. Because again, we are listening to feedback from students as to what are books that they want to read. We usually do a little survey in our ethnic lit courses um, and get feedback from them on books that they're interested in reading about, and then we add those to our um, course book list for the next year. So it's not, again, that's not an area that a consultant has a say in. We pick our text. Trustee Dodge Jr., did you still have a comment? Just took a bunch of different turns. Um, Sorry. 
Because so what's of the Heart Foundation, they chose to go with this consulting group? No, no, no. I'm talking about we work with them independently of um, CRE. But we do have, um, so they, um, Kathleen Gutierrez put in for a um, grant that um, will allow us to be able to partner with her and um, some uh, Watsonville on the Heart lessons that they've created. Okay. One of those being an interactive map about the Watsonville riots, race riots. Um, but anyways, the grant was put into place so that um, in April when they do these, um, so I think it's called Sowing Seeds, when they have their exhibition, we're gonna be able to take like 15 of our ethnic studies classes over to that. So there's, there's that work in there. Our, our um, history and our English TOSAs work with Ka Kathleen and her group as well. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, some of the, most of the lesson work is coming from that interaction, not from our CRE interaction. So if we don't decide to go with this consultant, what happens to the ethnic study program here in PBOSD? Um, well, for one, um, we'll have to halt training our administrators. So basically, we're going to have um, courses functioning without real um, pedagogical understanding by our admin, which currently is in place and um, no fault of our admin, but it, it does affect, their lack of knowledge does affect how ethnic studies fits within their um, master schedules and prioritizing. So that's one thing. Um, the other piece is when we're looking at um, building out long-term training for any new teachers coming in, that would affect that as well because that would be, that's part of the, the work for this coming year is helping build out that larger scope and sequence, taking the work that we've done in the last two years and building out a solid PD plan yeah. for our new folks or people that are interested in becoming ethnic studies teachers. Um, Part of that work is, again, just like when we did the work the last two years with them, is um, guidance on, like, part of there is the, is the structure of, okay, who in your community are you gonna reach out to to help support the work at your sites? So that would be also when we're doing the PD, how do we fit all of that in? So why would Trustee DeSerpa's idea not be viable, or is it? Um, in terms of not contracting? Well, this group. Well, that's what I'm saying. So if we don't contract with them, our high schools, our, our secondary, our middle school and our high school administrators won't receive training. And any further progress will um, basically be on massive pause for now for our teachers. Can, can I ask a follow-up to that? I mean, I think the question, idea I thought I heard was, is there a UC Santa Cruz does, offers these services as well? In a similar way, different way, you decide not to go with they, them? So if what? we work with UCSC, it's more around, um, um, it, well, and I'll be on, okay, so two things to that. Um, the department that we are working with right now is not actually their ethnic studies department. The one that we're working with right now is their history department. Um, and that, that partnership isn't around teacher training. That partnership is around the lesson building that we are doing in the classroom. So it's not, it's not they don't come out and do long-term training sessions because that is one of the things in the, the model curriculum where it talks about PD needs to be long-term and sustainable. So we wouldn't be able to do that through them. Um, and if we are gonna have, uh, try and contract with any of the professors up there, I would be very surprised if it was for free. Um, so the other piece to that is um, I know that there was also concern brought from a member of the community that we shouldn't be partnering with UCSC's Ethnic Studies Department um, at, because there's a lot of overlap between them and CRE. So we haven't gone that route yet, but because originally that's where we were going to reach out, but um, we're just continuing our conversations with the history department. So the concern was that if we there's overlap, meaning the problems where the concerns we're hearing about CRE tonight are present, for the same, or is it a different um, argument? It, that it was that that it's the same people 
Uh, the, that was the words. My understanding, the, the words were it was the same people in both, but my understanding from that was that it was similar um, similar beliefs, I guess. I wasn't, you know. So I, I, yeah. so I guess like a bigger question I have is to what, is this like, do we need consultants forever for this program or to what extent no. do we build in-house expertise and yes. is it your job to help train administrators at some point and is that? Exactly. And that's why this would be the transition year. So this is the transition year to help build out that piece of training for new teachers, that piece of training for administrators, um, to, to just wrap up the bow on the whole process. But isn't this a three-year deal? Are you looking at, oh, we're looking at no, this is a one-year. One-year? Yeah, How much one money year. is it? It's 110. 110. Mm -hmm. oh. Point of order, it's uh, 1008. I just want to um, make a motion to extend the meeting till midnight. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. You don't get to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please. Good. Trustee Soto. Uh, it, just briefly. So, this is the only consulting company we could go with? There's no other option? Um, that we have access to at this point, and I don't know of any other one. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm oh, sorry, Trustee Soto. No, please go ahead. Okay, Claudia, I have a question for you. Are you comfortable with this firm? I am. Otherwise, okay. I wouldn't come and ask. Is it a relationship that we've established that to this point in this last year that we'll be able to comfor comfortably transition out to where we can do it in house? Yes. Okay. Are we going to reinvent the wheel if we do something else? Probably. Okay. Because if another, if we do find another firm or a consulting firm, then chances are we're starting all over okay. again. Yeah. All right. So, Trustee DeSerpa, distinguished guests, I mean, I firmly respect your point of view, and I totally respect you know your Jewish point of view. Like I would expect you to uh, respect my Catholic point of view. But from a First Amendment standpoint, everybody's entitled to their opinion whether we agree with it or not. Now, I'm not condoning whatever actions that person took, right. but don't misconstrue what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to respect each other's views. We have a viable program that's already been in place, and I don't feel that we need to disrupt it because of an opinion. So that being said, I support Claudia. Thank you. Is that a motion? I make a motion. I had some comments. Yes, I don't know if anyone else did go as ahead. well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, I think it's a shame that that wasn't looked into better before hiring this consulting firm, for one. Um, I also think that in light of recent events in our community, that we've seen bigotry firsthand, racism, discrimination, and I am just absolutely appalled that our district is affiliated with anything that even has a hint of being affiliated with anything of the kind. That, that just absolutely appalls me beyond disgusting belief. Um, while you were speaking, I did a Google search for you, and yeah, there are several other firms okay. out there that do this for public education. So, um, much probably to many people's surprise, I actually am going to agree with Trustee DeSerpa tonight on this, mm -hmm. um, because I, 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 I'm, I'm just absolutely disgusted, just disgusted, and it's beyond an opinion. It's about things that have clearly been said or done or stated by this person, and I, I just am appalled that our district is, has any connection to anything of the kind. I won't support it. Okay. And, I, and with that said, I, I, the same as trustee to serve, I fully support ethnic studies. But this is not the only consulting firm in the state of California that could do this. I know we do. 
We have a first. Do we have a second? Yeah. Can I just say something? I mean, what you've presented, I've, I, and I think what, from what I'm hearing about the way the program's being implemented, I, th I think it's a good thing. I just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a controversy with one of these in this firm, and um, and I, I, res you know, I, res I, I hear that. My other concern is. Well, to what extent are we? Can we? Can we just do? I love building in-house expertise, and if we've already been doing this for two years, I, I, and we have some experienced teachers with this, I, I, I get maybe it's a capacity. And I think, do you have a TOSA on this too? We have. Well, we don't have a specific ethnic studies TOSA, no, but we have a history high school TOSA and an English high school TOSA. Yeah. And our English TOSA is new. So this is all new learning for her. Yeah. Our history TOSA was with us last year. So. Yeah. So I, it's one, I support the program. Absolutely. I think our teachers are doing, from what I'm hearing, a great job. Um, so I want that to continue. Um, is there another way that that can happen with some other help? Perhaps I I, I don't know enough about this out firm to. To, to 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 feel comfortable defending them 100 I mean it's there's obviously a controversy here with that firm so but I just want to make clear I support continuing what the program as it is and finding a way to do that and if that means continuing these discussions because I know this was supposed to come earlier and there's just this concern about this and we're obviously there's a concern here if there's a way to continue these discussions to figure something out um, or if we just need to have a vote to do that so be it. Thank you. Mr. Sheckman, do you want to weigh in at all on this? I don't, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want to put you on the spot. I attended the meeting on the 27th where Claudia presented. Our fine guests were there. And what I have seen in the 45 days I've been on this job is incredible work from Claudia and her staff. There, I've read about the controversies. I certainly don't agree with some of the stances the individual made, but as Kim pointed out, she loves the curriculum. She knows we've been working with the company for two years. Mm -hmm. We love the curriculum. That doesn't mean we're using the biases of an individual in that firm. We have really dedicated and talented staff. We'll figure out a way. I mean, the board represents democracy. We will figure out a way. Claudia is as good as it gets, but the plan that was set, I support. I'm not, I'm Jewish. I don't know that that has anything to do with the issue. There are a variety of ethnic groups we're going to uh, study. And uh, the final thing I want to say is as a teacher in the counseling ed department at San Jose State, when the law came into being, I brought it into class and used local districts in San Jose and what they were doing. And some of the districts were actually dropping electives to create an ethnic studies course. Okay idea, but I'm guaranteed there are gonna be some real controversies with the elective teachers who are losing their jobs. This district decided to integrate it, and it was with the help, I assume, of the consultants that we've used for the last two years. So we have a problem with an individual. We're not using her pedagogy. We're not using her philosophy. We're using a group of educators who have ethnic study degrees. And it was my understanding at the wonderful presentation at the temple that there was support for moving forward. A small group has represented what we're hearing tonight. But what I felt and sensed at the temple and the presenters including Claudia, Andrew Goldencrantz, and a professor from UCSC who shared her views that She's part of all these different organizations, and some people in the organizations are not to her liking, but she's still able to learn. So again, we will make it work. We are here, and, and you represent democracy, and we have a first, and I don't think we have a second, but I support the work that's been done in the district, and I really believe the quality of the work has been because of the people 
in this district, not so much consultants. Mm -hmm. That's my piece. So we do have the first. And I just, I want to reiterate the, how easy it is to sow division and what that causes. Uh, part of me wants to second, but I think this, for me as a board member who has to vote and make the decision for those watching, I, I think, and that's why I like having, this is a great discussion. I'm just hearing about this meeting at the temp. I'm glad it, ha it sounds good. And I, and I have a lot of trust and faith in our interim superintendent, Murray. So I respect his opinion. Um, but I, I do, I do like uh, ensuring that there's a deep conversation happening, and this is the first time we're having it in a, as a board in open session. So I, I wouldn't mind continuing second. the item. It's not a second. No, no, it's the second time we've. It's been before the board. Yeah. You got pulled. You got pulled. You're okay. You first. What would happen if this item were tabled for a later meeting? I don't think it has the support. You don't have a second. I think it just dies right now. No, I understand that. I'm not asking about the motion. I'm, I'm asking our superintendent and I'm asking Claudia in terms of logistics. Mm -hmm. So um, the next step would be to try and find another organization that could pick up where we leave off. That's really the bottom line. And I would echo that. Again, the board has the authority. Mm -hmm. We're trying to influence you, but you will make the final decision. Mm -hmm. This district has done a pile of really good work that we're not going to let go. No matter what, mm -hmm. we won't let go. But again, I'm being repetitive. For two years, we've used it. Um, they can <laughs> For two years, we've used the same company. The work people are praising. So I, I, I'll leave it at that. Is it conceivable that this could be brought back and uh, an, an alternate with another proposal, an alternate proposal with another consultant or a, another way to make this happen? I suspect we'd have to do that. Mm -hmm. We need your approval if we're going to use a mm -hmm. consultant. Well, I, I would move. I would make a motion. Uh, we have to wait till yeah. this one goes. Out. So we, it sounds like we don't have a second. So the motion dies for want of a second. Okay. 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 Thank you. So uh, I would move that you bring some bring back this item with a different consultant if you'd like okay I'll second that I, yeah. and I really I mean even though p potentially UCSC doesn't have a group right now maybe in place to provide this they can start building that I mean we have money to spend so do many other districts right so can I ask a clarifying question on that? because they thing? know our population they do yeah so can I ask a clarifying question mm -hmm. before I look into that? I just want to be sure that when we say UCSC, is there a specific department that you want me to work with? Because like I said, if there's concern. I don't want to be that directive, honestly, or prescriptive okay. to you. I, okay. I don't have a concern. I have worked well with both ethnic okay. studies and history up there. So I mean, that's fine. I just wanted to know that way I, if I can reach out to more than one department up there, yeah. including their ethnic studies department. Thank you. Yeah. That sounds like that would make sense to do that. Mm -hmm they have post departments yes yeah can can I just say I, I do believe though that that uh, there are outside community members that have concerns with certain UC Santa Cruz uh, departments and so if we bring back one then this may happen again yeah but as I said earlier while the there the Q&A was going I did a simple Google search there's plenty of firms throughout the state of California for public schools for the K-12 sector that do this consulting so your hands aren't tied yes yes I do I do understand that but what was asked is that do we want to stay clear of anybody that there might be a concern with Are so then that limits us in the search I think that just you do you guys just do some very serious vetting this time because last time the, the evidence was there that this was the person 
who every Jewish community rose up and said no to, right? And she got into trouble with the governor around that, and it still sounds like there's still trouble. Um, there was, I, I, I don't see the vetting there. It certainly was not presented to us as a board. So I'm hopeful that this time the vetting of whoever comes in next would be um, properly completed. So we will do the vetting and look into mm -hmm. it properly completed. We absolutely, Thank the one you. thing yeah. that we have to do is that a lot of the top people within ethnic cities actually work together. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make yeah. sure that it is clear that all of those folks are stayed clear from anything. So we, we will see what we can do to bring someone back who is not affiliated with with anybody where there's a concern. But also has degrees in ethnic studies. Yes. Because I want to be really clear on that piece, that whoever we are going to be looking at should have ethnic studies degrees. I think that's only fair to help lead the work. That's okay. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. Oh, we have a first and a second for that motion to bring this back with another okay. thing. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any yeah. opposed? That motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for all the hard work. Really appreciate it. All right. Um, item 9.11, appendix to PVUSD and Cabrillo College uh, CCAP agreement, annual update. Report will be presented by Julie Edwards. Or us, not Julie Edwards. Okay. Uh, Chrissy McLean. Good evening, Superintendent Sheckman. President Holm and PVUSD Board of Trustees. My name is Christy McLean, Coordinator of Counseling Programs, here to uh, present this, uh, this action. And with me, please, I would like us to let our, our partner from Cabrillo introduce themselves, who you probably know. Good evening, board members, uh, interim, Superintendent Shmshekman, and uh, President Holmes and I also want to say um, that I'm very proud that Ruby's here tonight as a Grizzly representing uh, as a student trustee. Um, I am the director of college readiness and dual enrollment at Cabrillo, three months in the job, a former PBUSD employer, employee, principal, and I am honored to be here tonight. So tonight we are um, going to be presenting um, an, ad uh, an addendum to our agreement with PVUSD and Cabrillo. Each year, the collaboration and depth of engagement continues to grow with PVUSD and Cabrillo College around dual enrollment opportunities for PVUSD students. This includes students who enroll individually, as well as dedicated um, whole classes via the, the PVUSD and the Cabrillo College CCAP agreement, which I'll define in a second. These opportunities for dual enrollment provide early college credit attainment for PVUSD high school students, and for many, it begins their, their college journey while they are in high school. So this appendix that we're presenting reflects the update to dual enrollment CCAP courses to be explored and offered with sufficient enrollment in the 23-24 school year. This item, item 911, affirms this growing um, depth and quality of the relationship between PVUSD and Cabrillo College, with a clear demonstration of our mutual commitments to our students' success in post-secondary education and engagement while in high school. Working with our value partners at Cabrillo, we are moving toward highly connected programming between PVUSD and Cabrillo College. So um, CCAP means College and Career Access Pathway Partnership Agreement. And as you can see here, we have outlined some of the outcomes, and you may have seen this before because we have presented the, the five-year agreement in the past, and it was Julie Edwards. Julie, if you're watching, we say hi. Um, she's sorry that she couldn't make it this evening, but we all work together on the same team. Um, so the uh, CCAP represents that cost-free dual enrollment college course for high school students. Um, each semester, we do a new appendix to present the new c courses that might be offered. And that is in addressed in our contract. Every five years, we do a renewal of the whole agreement with the financial commitment from PVS, PVUSD for textbooks required for the dual enrollment courses as applicable. And then dual enrollment is for CTE and core subjects to benefit students with, again, like we talked about, earned early college credit, familiarity to the college environment, and degree acceleration. 
And it's important, um, it's important to note that students who complete college credit while enrolled in high school are, and there's lots of data on this, are more likely to earn high school diplomas, to enroll in community colleges, and four-year colleges, and to attend post-secondary education on a full-time basis. And most importantly, to complete degrees. More students who start in dual enrollment have a higher percentage of actually completing their degrees than other students. I'll have um, Ms. Mason talk about some of the courses that we're offering this year. So currently we are doing our CCAP agreements, which include elementary sign language one and two. The instructor is uh, teaching online with the hope that we transition to in-person at Aptos High School where we can feed the other schools into that um, class. Uh, Baila Folklorico one and two, and it, and it changes. Sometimes spring students really want yoga, but it is helping them attain that uh, dual credit. We also have currently medical terminology. It is exciting that I got to see and join the class last Tuesday. 17 PVUSC students there, including a ninth grader. She was so excited. She made it on that bus to get from Pajaro Valley to the Watsonville Center. So it's been a delight to see that. Uh, personal health will be offered in the spring. Child Growth and Development Press of Lab. We're doing a new pathway for education and hopefully we can start inspiring future teachers with that collaboration. Uh, biotechnology will be coming next school year for, again, Aptos in a classroom. Uh, planning for Success is popular, as well as our first entry level course where students get familiar with college and in the hopes of exactly what Chrissy said, continue that alignment and keeping students familiar with what college is about and sustain them and uh, support them in their two year or four year college or career plan. English 1A, Library 10th, and College Algebra. We also have five students in Math 12 statistics. Um, I met them all. They're excited to be there, and uh, PVUSD has agreed to purchase their uh, Alex uh, trial uh, for their practice. And so in closing, we would like to say that PVUSD and Cabrillo would love to continue our partnership and expand the course offering for our students in order to enhance their college and career plans and success one student at a time. And so staff um, recommends, we recommend um, consideration and approval of the appendix to the PVUSD and Cabrillo College CCAP agreement. All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Just a quick question. Um, so these these classes on here, I understand they get right, they get college credit, and um, but what I'd like to see on here are some more rigorous courses. Is that planned in the future? Yes, absolutely. And one of the rigorous courses that we weren't able to fulfill this uh, fall was biotechnology because we had the student population. We had three courses of the introductory level class that was a prerequisite, but because of the time um, that we were offering the course at the site, it just didn't work out for the students once their schedules was placed. So we know that is a rigorous course that has a prerequisite and we do want to bring it so there is plans to continue and continue also math. Math is another one that students want whatever's not offered at their school to be offered through Cabrillo. So we are looking at finite math, other courses that will increase their rigor and support their um, career uh, choices. Yeah, we have kids that come in front of us that have asked us that are, um, that, have, that, that the more advanced maths are not um, mm -hmm. readily available at their campus, and Correct. so it would be really great to have those opportunities for them to go to Cabrillo. And that's, I think, the highlight of my job is I get to still work for my community for PBUSD and making sure that our students are getting access to all those courses, but they're not limited to those courses in the CCAP. They also can go through the individual dual enrollment. So everything opens up for them. What we do let them know is that to be cautious, if they are taking a rigorous course, to ensure that they, if they do need advice on whether they're gonna drop it or not, to do it during the deadline so it's not on their academic record, but all the courses are open to them. We advise them to start with their school counselor to make sure that they're able to take on that challenge and we support them. We do approve individual dual enrollment for any Cabrillo course. And uh, just to add to that, uh, you know, 
There are um, continuous meetings with our team and Cabrillo's team, especially with Julie Edwards, uh, looking at the CTE pathways and looking at how to articulate our, our present CTE pathways in our schools and adding that next level of Cabrillo course possibly being taught at, at the school. So they would be getting that dual enrollment for the CTE college level course, but on their high school campus as well. Trustee Scott? Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. Um, so with respect to that, so is there a difference between the CTE pathways and what you're presenting here today? Is this all part of the same program or just this is what we're doing for this year? Is that, or is it, how does that work? So what we are talking about is the CCAP, so it's kind of what Ms. Mason just spoke about, how there's individual dual enrollment. So any student that wants to take a course at Cabrillo during their high school career, they go, they get make sure talk with their counselor, make sure that it, it will work for them, they meet with Cabrillo, and that's like they're open to the whole Cabrillo catalog. Mm -hmm. Through this CCAP agreement, um, th these courses are, linked to CTE and linked to it with a commitment through uh, and attached to a bit of a grant that is through um, the agreement with PBUSD and Cabrillo. Whereas those individual enrollment classes are not connected to a certain funding source that, that we are trying to uh, work on together with to increase that dual enrollment in a very purposeful manner as opposed to just like always kids could always go take a class. So at what does a grant pay for? Well, now I wish Julie was here. Um. <laughs> I've actually worked with Julie in the articulated courses for CTE, and they are not all of them. So the only certain of certain um, pathways, so certain CCAP, for example, medical te technology terminology can lead into the patient care CTE pathway, but it's not all of them, and it's not the, the purpose uh, that Cabrillo has. Our point of view is to only service CTE, but we are doing it when we work collaboratively with Julie Edwards and CTE. What can we offer that will give them dual credit and um, uh, dual credit and increase their uh, pathway? So it's not all of them, some of them, but they all have a purpose. I, I know our district, we used to offer a, a paramedic prep CTE class that we lost because we, we brought in the teachers from the county, a lot of the CTE teachers, they came in at a lower salary, didn't like that, and then we didn't rehire some of those classes. And that was a very popular class. And I know one of the Cabrillo teachers was saying that she feels her students are pretty underprepared for that. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know if that's, you know, just, I'm just bringing that up. As this. So just my question is, is like, how, in, in determining classes going forward, how do we figure out, well, is that something we should offer at PVUSD, or is that something we should send a kid to Cabrillo for? Well, well, one of the, uh, um, I think, were you talking about surveys? We've done surveys. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's, I guess, the, the surveys that I don't know about, but when it comes to the CCAP and the CTE, it's trying to keep it in line. So right now, even just in PBUSD, we don't, um, we're sort of, uh, as we've been, as Julia Edwards and PBUSD has been growing the CTE program, there isn't, there aren't like random one classes you would take, there are pathways. So the real focus and the part of the CCAP grant is how do we increase those pathways? So not like, how do we increase a student to just take one class, but how do we really in, like encourage them to build their, their depth of knowledge in a certain uh, area, especially if it's career oriented, mm -hmm. so that when they, as they're doing this journey, they're college and career ready, and they're really getting more of an idea of what they want to do next at whatever post-secondary it is. So there's conversations with the directors um, in, uh, in the curriculum department here in PVUSD and lots of conversations with the Cabrillo and the director of, uh, of the dual enrollment staff plus just the director of PVUSD. And it's, that's why we come before you and we yeah. come every semester to do the appendix mm -hmm. so that we can talk about this kind of stuff, get input, share the kind of classes that we're working on, and continue to just grow the program to benefit students and prepare students. I, I, Julie, Julie actually works with the teachers that have articulated courses for CTE that are mm -hmm. also getting the Cabrillo College credit. And we have them listed on 
uh, I believe PBUSD's website as well as Cabrillo, which are those pathways that are getting that articulated credit and they're also getting um, the opportunity to get dual enrollment and certification at the same time. And are there any financial implications for PVUSD with respect to dual enrollment or with our teachers? Only the cost of textbooks for those CCAP courses. And uh, Cabrillo provides the rest. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's great overall. And I, I, I want to help kids go to Cabrillo and, and it's and this is a wonderful, so that's, I'm asking a bunch of good questions because I support it, and I want to see us expand our, our CTE offerings in an intelligent way. And uh, Somebody told me, I don't know who it was, we used to work at PV High, that there's a bunch of interest in sustainable agriculture there, and lo and behold, the teachers there want to do that, and there's a great horticulture program at Cabrillo as well, and the land trust is op opening a new space just down the road, so wouldn't that be beautiful? So um, maybe we'll, we can work on that. But, uh, Absolutely, and guess what? Cabrillo has a grant, uh, Title V, and that's an area they're looking into. We just need to get uh, a survey out to students to have the data. Well, bring us some money, uh, Consuelo. Right. We want that money. Come on. <laughs> and and um, Julie Edwards has uh, has many longstanding conversations with the Ag Department at Cabrillo, and um, there, there are definitely plans in the works in that department. Vice President Acosta, did you want to make a comment? If you have something, you can go. I'll oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll. If you need a motion, I'll make a motion All to right. approve. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll second. Great. I will be abstaining just because I'm a Cabrillo employee. I'm the director of the nursing program, and it's like, you know, students come through this way. But it's like, I, I just, I do want to add that um, it is a, uh, you know, it, we're, we're seeing students come to, you know, my program younger because they've been able to ha get some of their prereqs. And, you know, it's like we had a great problem where, you know, had to look at, okay, how do we deal with a student who enters our nursing program and they're not yet 18? Because mm -hmm. they did all their prereqs when they were in high school. Mm -hmm. And it turns out we could totally do that, that there's no restrictions on that. It's like, oh, that was news to me. But we had never had to deal with that before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the implications of people being able to enter our healthcare professions, to be able to earn wages to live in this area, mm -hmm. you know, opens up opportunities for, you know, people in our community in a very, you know, real and sustainable way. So while I will be abstaining, it's a fantastic opportunity um, so I actually have my um, comment is actually more directed at our um, superintendent and I'm, I want to extend an apology to our guest presenter um, and community partner um, my request superintendent Sheckman would be going forward um, that you can direct your staff that when they know we have guest speakers on an item that's being presented or community partners here that they let us know that at, or you know that at the beginning of the board meeting if we don't know that at agenda setting so we could put those items towards the front of the agenda because we can always before approving the agenda make a motion to move something up I think it's not really acceptable to expect a community partner to be here after 1030 at night it's sort of you know it's one thing for us it's one thing for the staff the staff sort of signed up for that with their jobs so if you could direct that and we could also stop being here past 1030 at night if we can keep staff on point on their time for when they're doing their presentations. It's just And my you. response is Consuelo left our district too bad for her. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can do that. I actually whispered to Jennifer, we had two guests on the previous item and thought we'd move it up a bit. The two items in front were very short, so it wasn't a problem. But we should look at that and, and be able to in my past here, we've been able to look at the agenda and say, we have guests for this one item, can we move it up? And the board has generally Thank agreed you. to that. So, but in this case, you know, you run PV, you do a good job, and then you leave. I'm just kidding. Great to see you, Ms. Mason. I am just 10 minutes away. No, and we, <laughs> but I do have to say, you can't be Cabrillo because I'm only five minutes away well, from my new office. And <laughs> Thank you, and I, I, I do want to, I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the feedback, and 
I just I am looking at the time and how many more agenda items on. we have, and so I don't mean to. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries seven zero. Thank All right. Thank you, you thank so you. much. All right. Um, item, Murray, this one's on you. Murray. Murray, you're presenting the next one. Oh, can't get away now, brother. Um, 9.12 approved contract of employment for assistant superintendent. That's you. Okay. And I have Allison to assist. It is a pleasure to be able to present a contract and somebody's name on that contract who's sitting in the back who did a great presentation earlier. We need this position. We've got a great start to the year. Um, I look at my group over there, and in particular Lisa and the work that she's done, and the directors too, that have picked up the work of our elementary superintendent. And so it is with great pride I encourage this board to uh, honor the contract and uh, welcome the individual named on the contract to that position. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have three. Um, Jen Bruno, Dan Weiser, and Michael Berman. Murray. Murray. For yes. the public at home who can't, aren't, don't maybe have access to this, do you want to name the person on the contract? Okay. But I think if it goes on the microphone and through. Anyway. Oh, want me to do that. Yes. Yeah, it is with great honor to say the name Claudia Monjadas to serve as the assistant superintendent in charge of elementary ed. Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Sheckman, and Board of Trustees. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, Director of Expanded Learning and mother of four PVUSD students. And tonight I speak on behalf of being a director and a parent of four of our PVUSD students. I highly urge you to move forward with this contract. Claudia is committed to student success, both through the planning of instruction and the support of teachers with both materials and professional learning. She is a collaborative partner across content areas and departments. She assisted with summer school and is always has her door open to any of us directors who might need a partner or someone to talk things out. She's knowledgeable on a wide range of topics and can support admin in elementary on a variety of topics. She's knowledgeable about our district and how we can move forward together. When we had any issue arise last year during the flooding, she was one of the first directors when we all gathered and started our team, our emergency response team. She helped with ensuring students had clothes, housing. She was at Lakeview with everybody else over in that area as we opened up Parho within a number of days. She is a team player, player, a community member, and a mother. And I know that the programming that she wants for her own students, she has one PBOSD student left, is the same programming she wants for all of our students. And to me, that's really important. She's not just building programs for all, she's building programs for all students. And she sees all students. Um, and I really strongly believe that having her in our programs will move our elementary schools forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. Um, I just wanted to briefly say how critical this position is. Um, and how important it is that we get the right person in that role right away. Uh, speaking from, I should have introduced myself, Dan Weiser, Director of Technology. Uh, and from the technology perspective, the way technology is constantly changing, um, how all of the education technology and digital curriculum is um, you know, continually evolving and impacting our classrooms and 
all of the different systems we use to for performance data and communication systems for our parents, our community, um, and then all of the other curricular aspects of incorporating technology, having someone that really has that level of ex expertise, having been a, 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 a site principal at Hall District, I've had the great pleasure of working with Claudia in all of her different roles um, as a coordinator in Ed Services and a director in Ed Services, and I, I'm really excited uh, to have her now working as the assistant super elementary, and I think she really is the ideal person to take take that role and and to really collaborate with all of us directors to make sure that we're continuing to provide the best education for our students. So I'm just here to encourage you to approve this item and to support Claudia. Thank you. He's tall. Good evening again. Um, I'd like to speak to two uh, points regarding this item. The first is the position. Um, I believe this posi position, when well occupied, can be a significant driver in achieving our goals of providing students with opportunities uh, to achieve their greatest potential. And this brings me to the second point, the person. I've known Claudia for almost 20 years, and in that time she has been a leader, a learner, a collaborator, and an innovator a listener, and most importantly, an ardent advocate for our students, families, staff, and community. Her devotion, intelligence, integrity, experience, and her capacity to lead collaboratively make her the ideal candidate for this position. And I ardently encourage you to approve this item. Thank you very much. Do we have any discussion from the board? Um, Vice President Acosta. Yes, thank you. So, I have, um, and this is not at all directed um, towards the individual or the person, a um, few issues that I take with this contract is one, the term of the contract. Um, right now, we are, as we just had earlier this evening, uh, the discussions on our seeking for um, a replacement uh, for our permanent superintendent um, to replace eventually our interim superintendent and I just really struggle with an interim superintendent making a what is essentially a three-year contract for another incoming superintendent um, that locks in that superintendent too and it's not uncommonplace, right? It, you know, for if you do this scenario in comparison to the business world, right? A CEO comes in and will often surround themselves and their highest level position people with people they know. And I think that we need to afford that opportunity to this new incoming superintendent number one, um, and that it's this locking this in on a three-year contract to this individual without the new superintendent having any say in that I, I I just have a strong issue with that I think it's out of place for the interim superintendent to do that I understand a need um, or a desire about filling the position and that also brings me to my second point of a topic that is coming up later on our agenda because we keep talking about this issue of declining enrollment we're going to have an agenda item about maybe the board discussing having potentially a special study session hopefully that happens I think that's an important conversation that needs to be had at this board level and part of that conversation may have to include looking at what we are doing with our district to address declining enrollment we can't just sit around and keep screaming about declining enrollment and not do anything about that and what sort of restructuring might that be for the district and might that even be at the cabinet level so that's a, a, a second reason I on really just struggle with this I just think the timing of this is poor the length of the contract is absolutely poor and um, I won't be supporting it trustee scow um, well I I am um, hearing everything that's been spoken and thank you to those speakers who spoke in favor of, of Ms. Uh, I've, 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 I believe she's a great candidate for this uh, position. Um, 
I am looking at the picture as well that we will be bringing in a new superintendent. I do not know who it's going to be. I have no idea. And as we've seen, it's been custom in recruiting and attracting talent. I'm sure we'll be asked, will they have any say on any of the cabinet members? And if we were to approve a three-year deal tonight, that's certainly not, uh, as long as we honor the current contracts we have. And we are in an interim year, and things are a little bit different in an interim year, though I'm going to give Superintendent Sheckman a lot of credit for doing a great job, for the most part. And we don't agree about every little detail, but that's okay. That's democracy. Um, so I do have an issue with the length of the contract, not the candidate. I think the candidate is excellent. Um, so I would support an interim position um, and uh, I think affording some protection to this candidate. Um, I, m my sense is that if she does a great job, and I expect she would, that the board and the new superintendent would recommend that she stay. Um, or if something happens a little bit differently with the new superintendent and the board wants to go a different direction, that this person be able to return to her previous position. Um, so I think that's a reasonable approach. I know this is, it's an odd year, it's an interim year, um, but that's something I, I'm hearing what you're saying, Superintendent Sheckman, you want somebody in that position now? So I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, um, but that's, that's the term, I think the time of the year is a little different, and that's something I can, I feel comfortable with right now. Trustee Dodge Jr. You know, something that the previous superintendent prided herself on was having the ability to surround herself, run the cabinet, that's what she wanted. You know, I, I, I agree, you know, maybe for a year or interim, but, uh, you know, it should be up to the next permanent superintendent. You know, Mr. Murray Shackbin, you know, we, we butt heads, but I will have to, you know, not support a three-year contract. So if this contract is not approved, is it possible to bring back a more What you're suggesting is another interim position, and I understand. Um, I'll need to lean on Allison and, and my colleagues over there. How many interims do we have in our district at this time besides me? Aptos Jr., both positions at the school, Watsonville High, where else? Mar Vista is going to be a permanent one. Okay, Watsonville High, which I said. I mean, there's interims and then there's vacancies because of, right, that we haven't filled because of those, so. Okay, and that's the second point I want to make. If Claudia, and who knows if she'd agree, if Claudia agrees to serve as an interim in the assistant soup position, then the position she's vacating, we cannot fill with a permanent position because she has a right if, as Board Member Scow says, the superintendent says we're not a match, she has a right to her old position. So if I'm not mistaken, we couldn't fill that position with a permanent person. We can come back, but please recognize the delays in other positions, in the one other position that would take place. Um, this somewhat relates. When I was first hired, the date that was told to me was October 15th. The board president and I agreed that that was not realistic, and then the date was delayed a little bit. But what we saw today, and I'm not complaining, I might be whining a little bit, um, is if somebody's hired in March, they're going to look at the district and say, Thank you. I'm really excited about coming. I get to finish my contract wherever I am, and I'll be there on July 1. That's what I'm going to predict. I could be wrong. Somebody might start in March. But the kind of candidate you want is somebody who's made a commitment to their district with the contract that they're on, and you don't want them to break a contract. Sometimes negotiations are made, but your work in delaying it, and again, means I'm here for the year, and we're really creating a delay in many ways if we don't put an assistant soup in elementary ed. 
in place. And then the final thing I want to say is the world has such respect for Ms. Monjada's work from Hall District to whatever job she's had, and I knew her way back when. And her daughters used to run around the lacrosse field like crazy, and I just love the mother that I got to see. So I really feel pretty strongly that anybody who works with Ms. Monjadas, and you only saw one small example tonight, will really enjoy and appreciate and grow. So if you do a one year, Ms. Monjadas might say, thank you, but no thank you. And she'll go back to her position and we'll re-advertise. So I really encourage you to think of the ramifications of your decisions. And Daniel, we don't butt heads that much. You said it twice tonight. <laughs> agree a little. I, I, thank you. I've said enough. I would also, you know, in, in the past we've heard from various members of the board that they wanted to see cabinet members come from within our district. And we have a qualified candidate before us who comes from within our district. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with reconciling that with a sudden support for you know, now we're seeing support for outside candidates? Okay. Um, so I'm also wondering about, you know, what this looks like, you know, for our potential superintendent candidates. I'm looking at the various delays we've already seen this evening. You know, and I'm wondering what our superintendent candidates look like and go, hmm, what kind of working environment am I stepping into? Um, I think that should also be a consideration. Dita Serpa. So I've seen Claudia work for many, many years and um, in particular, and I don't know that this was talked about tonight, but when she was at Ohlone, um the the achievement there was phenomenal um, I think if I remember correctly yeah and um, you were the reason I think for that in part um, I would also like to say that the workload for Lisa Aguirre right now is not sustainable she cannot do the job of the secondary and elementary and everything else she's doing in between it's unsustainable and she's burning out I know that because I care about her <laughs> and I check in with her occasionally. Um, so having Claudia in this position is really important now. The other thing I'll say is that Lisa started her tenure at this district under Dorma Baker. Dorma um, had Lisa here, Michelle came and Lisa stayed and I'm sure you, um, you were mentored by both of those very fine women. Um, into the amazing super assistant superintendent you are now. So uh, I'm fine with, I'm more than fine, I welcome um, the appointment of Claudia into an assistant superintendent position and she's excellent, she's super well qualified, she understands achievement and she'll do a great job. And I'll just say one final thing in that when a superintendent comes, if there are clashes in personality or they don't think their cabinet is doing the right type of job, people typically don't stay because it's uncomfortable. So I'm not worried about um, a superintendent coming and not being happy with his, his or her cabinet. Um, that'll work itself out uh, with time. So I'm completely in support of this um, contract tonight. Thank you. Sure. I'll make a motion to approve. Well, I just I just want to reply to some. I agree with a lot of what Board President Holm and Trustee DeSerpa said. We disagree on attr the attractiveness factor of recruit. Of, and I'm not. And I and I don't want to be misinterpreted that I think we should necessarily bring in a new cabinet person from the outside necessarily at all. But I do think it is out of respect and knowing that the new candidate will have some input because if we do this three years which I do not support tonight they do have they do not have any input and having said that I support her starting tomorrow I think she's gonna do a great job so I'm not saying we shouldn't delay it 
um, but I and I understand she may make and there's some choices that may need, need to be made but I support getting her in there as an interim right away Trustee Soto yeah I support Claudia too so I'm two for two for you tonight Claudia I, I've known her from the past years when she was at Hall District as a principal over there and when I was running the maintenance department I was always interacting with her and she was always welcoming very professional and you know we tried to do what we could for her um, as far as the recruitment process for the superintendent her appointment is just going to establish a good team for whoever that person comes in whether it's someone from Southern California, the Valley, Northern California, wherever they come from, or who knows, even here locally. But they're gonna have an established cabinet that's familiar with the district. With, and if we start doing the math with the years of experience between all these individuals, I'm sure we're gonna have more than double digits. Um, so I support you, Claudia. Trustee Flores. Um, having, I, I was actually surprised to see this item tonight. Um, I didn't realize we were this close um, to already appointing this position. Um, and had we, you know, discussed this prior, I probably would have suggested um, not a three-year contract. So I'm, as far as you know, what I've heard here, um, I I feel I agree with uh, Trustee Bolano Scal in a sense that. Um, it has nothing to do with the candidate, and like, and I'm fine with. Um, I don't know that we even need to do interim, but interim up to um, a year, the end of the school year, up, I'm, that's kind of where I'm leaning. Um, but even it doesn't have to. I, I don't know if it has to be interim or not. But just the three year is what is what I am kind of stuck on. All right, I have a motion. No second. Okay, I have a first and a second. I'm going to ask that you roll call the vote. Absolutely. Let's have a roll call vote. Trustee Bolaños, your vote? No. Trustee Flores, your vote? No. Trustee DeSerpa, your vote? No. Trustee Dodge, Jr., your vote? No. Trustee Soto, your vote? No. Trustee uh, Vice President Acosta, your vote? No. And um, President Holm, your vote? Yes. Motion fails, uh, three, four. No, the motion failed. So item 9 point. Okay. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to uh, make another motion to, um, um, I think we're offer, offer a uh, contract, whether it's for a specific one year or through the end of the school year for, uh, for the same candidate for this, for this job. That point of order, please. No. I need to talk with the candidate and see if she's in agreement before we approve a contract for a term that she might not agree to. So if it failed, we can bring it back, but I understand okay, the okay, board's direction, but I need to talk to the candidate. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'll echo that my support of what it will be will be till June 30th, um, 2024. Um, that I'll support an interim position for the candidate and also with the potential of ha looking to have an interim fill her current position and that if things do not work out um, and she doesn't get moved into that role on a permanent basis that to um, superintendent Sheckman's point that she has the option to be able to go back um, so that's where I'd stand and you're saying you don't want a motion I mean because we can make a motion to make that the offer and then you can decide and then that way if she accepts she can right. start 
Right. I understand the direction of it only wanting to come back as a one-year contract, so I understand that. I just didn't no. want to approve a contract with right. her name on it if she doesn't agree. I'm s I said till June 30th, 2024. That's not a year. Well, it's the, the academic year. Sorry, this the rest of this school year is what yeah. I meant. That that's what I was wondering. So, what I said, June 30th of 2024, for this candidate as an interim. And then that would subsequently need the other position, her current position, to be an interim. And then if things don't work out for whatever reason, that she has the option to go back to her current position. So you're saying don't make a motion? I'm saying not. I have to talk to the candidate if she would even accept that. So if you guys vote her into that and she declines, and I, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm trying to have not her resign from the position. I'm so I'm. I understand the direction you're asking of that. You guys want a. You want an interim position if it's this candidate and or a contract for only the remainder of the school year? I think interim is what protects her the best to get her the option to go back into her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very I, uncomfortable with this level of direction. Yes. This is a staff issue that Dr. Or Mr. Dr. Sheckman, Mr. Sheckman, Mr. Sheckman and staff need to work out. It's not for us to make that decision as a board. That is way too micromanaging. That is not the board's role at all. You so, can give direction, but that that's about it. And I feel like you've done a great job of giving the direction that that you want to. There's sure. others of us sure. that have different opinions. Right. And I'm just giving that what mine, I'm being clear. Because I think, I don't know if the misquote was to me or to Trustee Scow's comment or Trustee Dodge comments, but there was a misquote earlier about comments made that I never heard anyone say. Um, so I'm being real clear. And to correct you on that, the checks and balances, not you, my colleague, the, the checks and balances of the way the system works in this democratic society is that there are seven elected officials. They are elected to give direction to one person. And that direction is the superintendent. And then the superintendent is to lead the school district based off that direction. So we also were asked for direction, so we're giving that direction to the superintendent, Sheckman, but we're looking at his cabinet member because I think that's what he's asked us to do. Is everyone clear on the direction at this point? Uh, no. No, me neither. Uh, if June 30th, um, if that's what needs to be clarified, June 30th is, sounds good to me. So who would take a job like that, first of all, to only be guaranteed a job until June 30th? This is her career, you guys. That's ridiculous. Nobody would accept that offer. And then who's filling behind her? And that person's only there for the rest of the school year and then not guaranteed a job, that's crazy. So I, my, my, I don't think this can be settled tonight. Um, I think this needs to be taken back with um, Mr. Sheckman and staff and they need to bring it back to the next board meeting. We will do that. I'm going to go on record as saying any potential superintendent candidates watching this just now, I don't think that motivated them to throw their hat in the ring. Absolutely not. So, we have an idea of the will of the majority of the board. Point of order, um, Eva. I realized that um, in a previous motion, what the vote where I said I was going to abstain, I think I counted myself as a yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that for the record. Um, 9.13, Climatech Installation Agreement, Amendment Number 2. Uh, Clint? Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. Yes, so as you may recall, last year we approved a contract um, with Climatech where they were doing work on Calabasas, as well as the district office, as well as um, Bradley doing some work in doing um, power resiliency and infrastructure for our district. We've been in talks with them about new funding, which the board may recall at the two prior meetings ago, we approved a resolution to be able to apply for CalShape funding, which is um, California Energy Commission's 
funding that they're doing to be able to improve both HVAC as well as electrical around districts in California. One of the requirements to be able to apply for the third round of CalShape funding is to actually have installation of um, CO2 monitoring in any sites that would qualify for this funding. So Climatech is able to do that work for us. Um, you can see the total amount is $420,000, uh, $420,480. About 80% of that would actually be covered by CalShape. So the district will be looking around 100,000 to be able to install all of these CO2 monitors. Um, the sites are listed on the, um, on the item. What this will do is, again, it, it not only gets those CO2 monitors into those sites, it also opens us up for additional funding for those sites. Um, between this and the next item, it'll open us up to the possibility of up to $6 million in additional funding for those sites for HVAC improvements. So with that, I'd ask that you approve the amendment to the Climate Tech contract so that we'll be able to move forward with installing the CO2 monitors. Are there any public speakers to this item? None. Any discussion from the board? Just a quick question for clarification. Carbon dioxide monitors Sorry, CO or monitor, carbon yeah. monoxide? Monoxide. Okay, so CO monitors. Yes, correct. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Just Trustee, to clarify. Yeah. CO, not CO2. Yeah, so okay. um, the state is, as I'm sure you know, pushing towards now whenever there's new construction, they actually want CO monitors to be included. Yeah, so CalShape is following along with if you want to do any improvements, we also want those CO monitors yeah, in those Those, those are the types of things that I look for in my current position. Yeah. So Absolutely. now are these integrated systems or are they standalones? Um, no, these ones, they're standalone, right? Yeah, they're standalone and they'll be, they'll be replacing, um, or there'll be our CO monitors as well as um, smoke thermostats. Oh, oh thermostat, yeah. okay. They're Pelicans. Okay, all right. Of course. Any further discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Uh, item 9.14, approved proposal with KFI engineers for HVAC analysis services, AB 841. Uh, Clint, still you. All right. Thank you once again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Sheckman. So as I noted in the last item, there are two pieces to being able to qualify for the AB 841 or the um, CalShape funding for round three, which is actually where the repairs or improvements to HVAC are done. What this does is this actually does a survey of those HVAC units to show the need and the, um, the requirements that are met by CEC standards. This contract actually would be fully paid out of round two of CalShape, so there'll be no cost to the district as these services are part of what CEC was adding, um, was offering as part of round two of their, their original CalShape funding. So this one won't cost, be any cost to the district, but it effectively lets us be able to identify to the state that our sites do qualify. The sites that were um, selected were selected based on their need of HVAC as well as their DAC or their um, disadvantaged community um, qualifications, which allowed them to allowed them to qualify most likely for that cow shape funding. The cow shape funding for round three is very competitive, so we wanted to select sites that would have the best chance of getting that funding. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Make a motion to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. Thank you all. All right, item 9.15, approve architect amendment number one for EB Design Studio Inc. for the Bradley Elementary School roofing and fire alarm upgrades project. 2024-01 report will be presented by Erlindo Mendez. Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities. Good evening, President Holm, Murray Shackman, and Board of Trustees. My name is Adriano Fernandez, and I'm the Director of Maintenance and Operations. I'm here today to ask for the approval for the uh, amendment number one for the amount of uh, $18,050 to go to EB Designs. This amendment is to reimburse EB Designs. They went ahead and paid the DSA fees, 
so we can get that project underway so it doesn't it wouldn't be delayed if we did we had a deadline to meet if we didn't get that dsa paperwork in or check in the project would have been delayed three months so eb design went ahead and paid for that fee so now we're just looking to reimburse them so this amendment would add 18,000 to the original contract so I'm looking for the approval on that do we have any public speakers to this item we have none any discussion from the board so did this come out of their performance bond to cover the cost or no this is coming out of a uh, ESSER funds yeah what I'm, what I'm saying as far as what they paid do, do we know no typically the the school district covers it no, what I'm saying is out of what the contractor paid, did they use a performance bond or did they just pay it outright? And now we're just reimbursing them to cover that cost, right? Yes, correct. Okay, but well, we don't know the previous question, whether they paid it outright or it came out of their performance bond. They paid it outright. They paid it outright. Because it's, it's typically something we do out of, out of our planning department office, but it was so short, sh so short notice to get yeah, it in just on time, we, just because of all the paper we have to do yeah. here. And it would, we wouldn't have made it on time to get that check and send it over to DSA so we could get the project going. Send so they, it back, yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks. All right. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to support. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, uh, item 9.16, draft amendment number two to joint powers agreement with Santa Cruz County and Rio Del Mar Playground project proposal. You're not Clint. I'm Rich. Rich. Uh, Rich Ariano, Director of Purchasing. Uh, yes, for your approval tonight, um, bringing this back, the uh, proposal and design for the Rio Del Mar Park Playground and the amendment to the joint powers agreement with uh, Santa Cruz County. Uh, quick history, the JPA was established in 1978 to create a shared uh, recreation space on the Rio Del Mar campus. Uh, amendment number one was approved in 1994 to update the facility and we're bringing amendment number two which would allow Santa Cruz County to provide up to $50,000 for um, the project and the total project cost is $82,100.07. Um, will be funded with redevelopment funds from the district. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? This is great. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Great. I have a first and a second. I just want to say I've been in conversation with the site principal and parent group about this. You know, this playground has featured a prominent role in my own family's time at Rio, 17 years or so. Um, I'm really pleased that this has come forward um, and that we're able to work with the county to renovate this joint use site so that kids can play safely. So thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. And I'll just add real quickly, we did squeeze the county for an additional $20,000. So good job, Rich and Clint. Thank you. Thank you to Supervisor Zach Friend for assisting yes. us in that. Absolutely. All right, item 9.17-23-24 LCAP revision approval. Good evening, President Holm, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman, and Board of Trustees. I'm here this evening to um, bring forward the revised LCAP. Uh, the County Office of Education has the opportunity to review and make recommendations. This presentation is, the recommend is based on those recommendations from the County Office. So the things that we um, looked at changing, number one is the uh, con contributing versus non-contributing actions of our unduplicated students. The metrics that are used that we have within the LCAP and expenditure tables. The expenditure chamber tables that we added either figures or we revised, it was due to technical glitches within the um, program in doc tracking that didn't transfer over or um, some, for some reason some of the fields did not match and so those are the, are when the numbers were not put in there so those numbers were placed inside those cells. The metrics, we, um, the dropout rate for middle school was placed in there. This is a state recommendation. It was in, then it was out, and so we placed it back in. 
The other metric is the misalignments of English learners. It was changed to misalignments of all students. This is because in 2022, the uh, CDE changed it from English learners to all students. And um, due to this, we had to change it to align to, this, to the state metrics. The last thing is looking at the contributing versus non-contributing um, funds that we use for our unduplicated students. We took out uh, goal four, action three, which is our core, core instructional materials. This is no longer included as um, a contributing item for our unduplicated students. The second one is the support services for students with an IEP, including push-in services. The things that we added in for non-contributing, these are items that, I mean, for contributing, these are items that were per previously as non listed as non-contributing. They are now contributing items, um, which are funds that we use of our concentration and supplemental for our unduplicated personnel, our students. Uh, the first thing was college and career development. This is our EAOP contract. Um, and then the next one is technology, anything to do with technology programs, our personnel that services technology to ensure that all of our students, including our economically disadvantaged students, have access to technology and technology programs. Goal three, action nine, use cinema project. Then we have save the music program, uh, bilingual stipends. This is to work with our student English learners. Um, language line service to help of our um, employees communicate with families of English learners. Family engagement and wellness center. Um, PVPSA counseling service, home to school transportation, and then life lab program. Those were the changes that were made. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? I'd like to make a motion to approve this. I have a question. Yes. So, this is a bit, on, can I, do after school programs count towards satisfying LCAP goals? Is that a straight legal yes or no, or is that kind of gray? Or, because obviously we can offer it to everybody, but not everybody's there. So the after school program is funded through different funding. LCAP is through LCFF funding, which is our, um, it's our general fund with our concentration supplemental funds for our unduplicated personnel. After school is a completely separate um, budget, so it is not within our LCAP. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a first. Do we have a second? Okay, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um, item 9.18 Study Session on Declining Enrollment. Uh, report will be presented by Mr. Sheckman. Thank you, President Holm. And um, Clint may join me on this. You know the issues, but we need to learn. You, you folks brought it up uh, through different content tonight. And so I would like to plan a study session on declining enrollment. We would like to involve folks from districts who've experienced declining enrollment and hear what their suggestions are. Uh, Clint is very interested, and I very much agree, in involving somebody from the California School Services Association. Do I have the right acronym there? Yeah, I thought I did. And unfortunately, the individual involved is not available on November 15th. And he will be a real key player because he has statewide, a statewide view, and especially of the fiscal fallout of declining enrollment. I've invited Nellie and the union to be involved, and they'll include their statewide representatives from districts who've had declining enrollment. And I've invited the CSEA to be involved, and I welcome uh, input from you folks about who should be there, but we're looking for expertise from districts and from a state viewpoint of what the heck happens. What are some steps that we as a district need to take? Because as the short report says, we've dropped 26% and we continue to drop. So the only, the only thing that's a little wrinkle from what we put there, the board agenda committee thought that November 15th would work. We'd like to change it. I wasn't sure if you were able to get some other tentative dates. So we're, we're probably looking in January is what, what I would suspect. So then do you want to bring this back as an agenda item for a later date? I would suggest we could, Clint's shaking his head, that we could have a real quick agenda item at our next meeting um, just to pick the date. Yeah, so to um, Superintendent Sheckman's point, I reached out to School Services of California and they 
it said they would be happy to. They actually have a team that specializes in declining enrollment. Um, their only downside was they could not make the 15th. The other date that they had offered was the day immediately after a board meeting, which I did not think any board members would want to come back to a board meeting immediately after a board meeting. So I asked, could there be a later date? Um, they said they could do January. Their only concern was that's a little bit late in terms of preparing. I explained to them, we've been preparing for declining enrollment. It's not like we need somebody to come tell us what to do next year. We just really want to look at long-term impacts. Um, so they were open to doing January. They just don't have a date exactly because it's a team of about three individuals. So they have to just coordinate all of their calendars. So, so do you need a motion to table this and bring it back? Is well, that what I, you need, Jen? Uh, how about a motion yeah. that um, says yes to a study session and that we come back and bring you specific dates that you vote on next time? Okay. Sure. I'm fine with Can that. I'll make a motion to, um, to have a study session on the declining enrollment topic and bringing that back to the board um, once you have a date so the board can vote on the date for the board's calendar. Second. And I'd like to bring it back next time on the 27th. Okay. Trustee oh, DeSerpa, did you have... And there was no public comment to no. that. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee DeSerpa, did you have something you wanted to say? I feel like I've seen this type of presentation from student services just in a regular board, board meeting. Is this not an agenda item that can just be in a regular board meeting? So I think um, there's a couple pieces. Uh, student uh, School Services of California is going to do it also on a global level of just what districts have done to combat declining enrollment. So they'll have a global lens through all of California. I think, um, and Superintendent Sheckman can speak to this, I think because he wanted to involve most of the unions and have them have their, their constituents as well kind of speak to it, we were just worried that the amount of time would be more than an hour or two, which impacts okay. because January is going to be I think busy with superintendent search so I'm just I yeah I'll, I'll try and get as many dates from school services as I can I kind of let them know if they can I asked for tonight if they could give me tentative ones and I would let them know by the end of the night which date we wanted so they could clear up their calendars unfortunately she just wasn't able to get back to me um, but I can definitely let them know if we can get multiple dates to try and kind of spread it out and pick a date that works and that way I, we can bring to the board more than just one or two dates. Thank you. Trustee Scott, did you have a? I had a question earlier. Nellie said something about negotiations coming up. I know that hasn't come. Is there a timeline generally for that? Is that in the spring or fall or is that what? for the round for next year? Is that, did she mean that is that happening this year for next year or is that next year is that undetermined? Sorry, That's is that related to this topic? Um, I'm curious about how that 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 will intersect with the, t just the timeline the general timeline and thinking about these topics that's I'm just curious I'm, I support the motion Sorry, I was just a question Do you want me to answer? okay it we're closed for negotiations for 23 24 with PBFT okay. so we have a first and a second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion carries 7-0 um, go, going on to item 10.1, uh, appointment in terms of commission members, personnel commission merit rule 3.1. Report will be presented by Pam Shanks. Good evening, uh, President Holmes, Superintendent Sheckman, board members. Um, I'm Pam Shanks, the Director of Classified Personnel for the District. Um, the Ed Code requires that I notify the board of any upcoming vacancies on the Personnel Commission. So just a quick background, uh, the Personnel Commission is an independent body. Um, that is charged with administering the human resources functions for the classified employees of the district. Um, by law, it is uh, composed of three members appointed for a three-year term, um, with the term of one of those members expiring each year. Uh, one of the members is appointed by the Board of Trustees, one member is appointed by CSEA, and the third member is appointed by those two commissioners called the Joint Appointee. Um, Mr. Casey O'Brien has been act, uh, serving as the board appointed commissioner and he has submitted his resignation effective at the end of his term which is uh, December 1st of 2023. Um, he has served on the commission for the last year and a half and has been a great addition to the commission. He's taken on a new role in his district and so has uh, decided not to serve another term. Um, he has been uh, wonderful to work with and will be greatly missed. Um, and this item is just to inform the, the board um, to fill the upcoming vacancy. Staff will be opening the announcement to accept letters of interest. 
and then staff will review the letters of interest and make a recommendation to the board at a later date. Um, after that recommendation, between 30 and 45 days after that, there will be a public hearing at which point the board would make their appointment. So tonight, this is just an information item for the board. Any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Scott? So it's... So are you making sort of a recommendation right now, or? or no, I'm just letting the board know of what the next um, part of the process will be, which would be opening an announcement to accept letters of interest for okay. the seat. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'll thank just you. add, if board members know of good candidates to serve on our personnel commission, we welcome that. Yes. Do, do we let you know that, or do we have to tell the who do we tell if we have names? I think you can let me know. Uh -huh. And I'll yeah. certainly pass it on to Pam and she'll do the due diligence. Right. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Going, thank you very much. Going on to our consent agenda. Um, our consent agenda items are our routine items before the board. Do we have any public speakers to consent? We have none. Are there any items the board wishes to defer? Can I have a motion I'll to? I'll make a motion to approve the right. consent agenda. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And we'll go on to our action report on closed session items. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, there are. Um, on closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on September 13th. 2023 with 13 and two additional action items and I'll need a second. second. Was first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right. I need to make the second one. On closed session item 2.3, uh, 2.3 or 2.2? 2. Um, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on September 13th, 2023 with 26 and six additional action items. Can I get a second? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6-1. Uh, uh, motion on closed session item sorry 2.7 in closed session the board voted 601 to reject the claim identified in closed session item number 2.7 on closed session item 2.8 in closed session the board voted 601 to approve the settlement identified in closed session item number 2.8 and we have three announcements um, on behalf of the district's administration um, our first announcement is um, that the district is pleased to announce Mr. Hector Perez uh, Jr.'s appointment to Director of Transportation. Mr. Perez Jr. has over 10 years of experience in school transportation, starting as a school bus driver in our district in, 20, in 2003. Excuse me. Mr. Perez Jr. became a state certified driver instructor and then moved into his role in PBUSD as a transportation supervisor. He left PBUSD two years ago to expand his supervisory experience working for North Monterey County Unified School District where he oversaw the transportation department leading a team of drivers, mechanics, and administrative staff. He has a strong background in providing ongoing transportation to transportation employees, maintaining a strong emphasis on student safety, behavior management, and positive transportation experience. Mr. Perez approaches his work with a positive attitude, commitment to the safe transportation of students, and is invested in the well-being of his community. Mr. Perez Jr. establishes and maintains great working relationships with everyone he comes in contact with. He deals effectively with a wide variety of people and handles all situations with professionalism. Mr. Perez Jr. looks forward to returning to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and serving the district in his new role. We are proud to welcome back Mr. Perez Jr. as our new director of transportation. The Pajaro, on behalf of the Pajaro Valley um, District Administration, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to welcome Francine Holland into the role of temporary principal of Ohlone Elementary. Francine worked for PBUSD for 26 years and retired in July of 21. She has been returning to PBSD since her retirement as an e ELPAC tester 
and a temporary administrator. We are appreciative of her dedication to the student staff and community of PBUSD and her willingness to return to us, um, to return and support us, go Otters. And on behalf of the district administration, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the uh, selection of Monica Cesarello as the new academic coordinator of Mar Vista Elementary School. Monica has been serving students in PVD since 2001 as a special education teacher, general education teacher, technology curriculum coach, after school program coordinator, and as a site administrator. Most recently, she has been a special education teacher at Mar Vista. And before that, she was the academic coordinator at McQuitty Elementary for seven years. Mar Vista is excited to have this very experienced educator in this role. Go see And that is all. All right. Our next uh, meeting is a regular board meeting on September 27th. And with that, our meeting is adjourned at 1138. Thank you, everybody.